biggest bad boy of podcasting is an entertainment based news program. The opinions shared are that of the host and their guests. Some celebrity voices are impersonated and usually not well. This program is not intended for kids and certain adults. Listener's discretion is advised. You have been warned. Now let's get ready to podcast. Welcome to another edition of Vegas Bad Boys of Podcasting. I got most of the guys here with me. King Lucky's on assignment. That means we have everyone else, like Simon Street. How are you? Hey, what's up, Arabs? Everybody doing good, good, good. Sin City Steve. Hi. How are we doing? Ah. <laughs> doing great. And then we got Matt Michaels. You know, my advice for uh, people out there is uh, sometimes in life, you know, you won't know it's sunny outside unless you just pull back the meat curtains. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> just saying. <laughs> the meat curtains are closed. You can't see the sunny. <laughs> and Arby's isn't the only one that has the meats. <laughs> yeah. All you guys are correct. Welcome to another edition. <laughs> That's how we're starting it. Well, look, it's uh, it's great to be back on the show. We got a three count coming up. And you probably saw that our description of the show maybe has changed a little bit. You maybe even heard a little bit of the intro changing somewhat. And it's nothing really major happening. It's just that we're adding a little bit more of MMA type of style. A little bit more fighting style, along with our wrestling that we get involved with. And we'll be kicking each other's asses. <laughs> and meat curtains. That's right. Kicking, meat, meat, kicking, meat, <laughs> kicking the meat curtains off. Right. Well, it's just like Rocky. Rocky used to punch the meat curtain. There you go. Right. That's there true. You go. That is true. I know what you're saying now. So that's what we're going to be doing. And uh, it's going to be exciting times as we continue to uh, move towards those other options and of course being that we're here in vegas you know we may dap it to other things that's not related to sports but it's vegas based so you never know who may pop on or who we may talk to let's get into three count it's time vegas bad boys of podcasting present one two three count talk (laughs) count talk baby Okay, so we have good three stories for you. And the first one is actually coming out from BJPan.com, a little MMA news here. And it's about Chris Cyborg. I'm curious to see what you fellas believe in this story. Now, if she's correct in her thoughts about Joe Rogan, and we'll talk about those in a minute, uh, why would he be so negative about a fighter who won their match, but showing more passion for a fighter that lost when he doesn't have a history of doing that. So is he doing the bidding for UFC by disliking her, or does he just really have more respect for Felicia Spencer? And this is talking about the match that happened on UFC 240. Apparently, Chris Cyborg did beat Felicia, but the commentary seemed to not really give her props at all and was given a little bit more towards uh felicia and she's saying and she meaning uh cyborg is saying dana first off he he's bullied her in the past so he she not trusting anything that he says and then joe rogan has said something that oh here it is right here actually it says on his podcast made fun of her having a dick on his podcast, which he went back on and apologized for. So I don't know. In some way, it looks like maybe Chris may have a point here about. Don't say Chris has a point or we'll have to well, apologize. Yeah. About that. yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <Ba-dum-dum>. <laughs> right. Okay. But. Right. Okay. But. What do you guys take is on, on on this story? Does she have a point here? Is, uh, is... I think she did have a point. Apparently, <laughs> from what was told, she does very much have a strong right point in the right direction. You know, in a minute, 
you all going to be doing apologies too, just like Joe. Hey, I ain't saying shit. <laughs> hey, hey, I will tell you this much. If I need to apologize, it needs to be in person. I'll be more than happy to be face to face and apologize. And Steve, you know that the one person who says that they ain't saying shit has probably got the most to apologize <laughs> for. You're goddamn right. <laughs> But I mean, let's let's. I mean, for real though, is UFC? They really have something uh, uh, against her here, and and so why? I mean, is this really being professional as a commentator <laughs> to just dig in, or, or is this really legit? Is uh, the Felicia Spencer really uh, someone that sh- should be admired, although she got her ass kicked? Well, let's go. Uh, let's let's put it this way. Yeah, <clears throat> there's two separate things going on here. Number one. What Joe said on his podcast was an entertainment-oriented podcast. Okay. Mm-hmm. So he was making a joke. It didn't go over well. He apologized. That's fine. Okay. The comment during the fight, mm-hmm. the UFC, the last time I checked, they do pay his salary, right? <laughs> they do. And so, therefore, they probably... You know, they probably are telling, you know, their broadcasters what they want to see in terms of the narrative of the show because that's what they create. Very simple. That's true. But it also says that Rogan has been vocal in the past about disagreements he's had with Dana or the UFC and proclaims he speaks independently and honestly. So would that be independently and honestly if... They're telling him what to say about her then. Well, in the past, I've said nice things about you. But after this interview, (laughs) things change. Exactly. Things change. Okay. Where am I going wrong, Simon Street? I mean, come on. What's the the story here? Uh, You know what? I I could be honest with you. I mean, things do change. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, people, you know, operate a certain way for a while and then they kind of realize where they're at and act accordingly and you know if he doesn't really i mean it's really entertainment at the end of the day anyways mm-hmm. even when there's a match yes they have to make sure that they're, they're doing a good job commentating and everything but at the same time i mean there's nothing there's no law saying he can't weigh in on who he favors okay. or 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 who he admired more in the match. I mean, I've seen tons of competitions to where the person that won was not entertaining at all, nor did I feel like, you know, they actually showed, I don't know, like really uphill battle to mm-hmm. win, you know? But the one person that they fought was probably maybe outmatched, you know? And right. they tried the best that they could, and despite what the public opinion might have been looking at it on paper... They overcame as best they could, and that's admirable. Why? My question is, is why shouldn't he be able to admire somebody? Why? Why is that such a big freaking deal? Sin City. Yeah. Um, Felicia had a undefeated record, mm-hmm. and she lost. Yep. Hi, Felicia. <laughs> <laughs> she lost. Yeah. At some point. Should that be acknowledged, Joe Rogan? Hey, you know she she lost. She put a good fight on. She lost, but Cyborg put on a fight, and she <clears> is the <throat> champ. Why is that not coming through through the commentary, and yet the opposite? So it's it's really simple. There are three sides to every story. Mm-hmm. Um, obviously, in this case, it would be Joe Rogan, it would be Chris Cyborg, mm-hmm. and it would be the truth. Mm. So <laughs> we have to, we have to consider that. You mean the European champion? <laughs> Jesus Christ. Oh, my gosh. This guy over here. <laughs> hey, yeah, this fucking guy. <laughs> this fucking guy. Uh, but, no, it, seriously, like, mm-hmm. ultimately what it comes down to is I don't feel like as if Joe Rogan is being fed lines from the UFC. Okay. Um, what I do feel is that there are things going on behind the scenes that the average fan does not have privilege of seeing mm. um namely uh and, and it it could be brought to light that um you know after after this article was put out that uh dana white has gone on record as saying that they are releasing chris cyborg from her contract mm. and that the ufc will no longer be promoting fights 
for Chris Cyborg and that they are completely out of the Cyborg business. <laughs> so wow. um, it, he also made some comments uh, alluding to the fact that she may have been asking for cupcake fights, easier fights, uh, so that she makes herself look uh, better than what she may actually be. Um, whether or not that's the case, um, there are very few uh, people that will know for sure. But I think that you might see uh, to where those comments by Dana White may have some shred of, of credence because it helps to reinforce this this narrative um, of painting Chris Cyborg as a heel. Um, I don't know if they're starting to, you know, go and default to pro wrestling <laughs> terminology and, right. and, and mannerisms and things like that. If they're smart, they do. Right. If they're smart, they do. But um, at the end of the day, uh, I think that, you know, if Cyborg is complaining about the, the opponents that, that they had it lined up for her, she wants easier matches, will not fight anybody that... You know, is a tough opponent. Blah blah blah. Then has she been? Uh, she's been caught saying that. Um, I, I, again, this is what's been re been reported. This is what's been reported. Gotcha. Okay. So, I mean, ultimately, it all comes down to that. And at the end of the day, Joe Rogan is just like you or me yeah. or Matt right. or Simon. Um, we're we're voices speaking into a microphone. We all have opinions, and we can say them. That's the wonderful part about being in the country where we are. Now, obviously, uh, this article makes allusion to the fact that Joe Rogan carries a lot of influence mm -hmm. and has a lot of influence because of his words and his reach. Big fucking deal. At the end of the day, mm -hmm. it doesn't matter how much or how little influence someone has. He's voicing an opinion, something that he is able to do. Well, it's, you know what? <clears throat> what's also very tricky here. Is you're talking about a guy broadcasting a sporting event. Mm -hmm. So you not only have the three sides, but now you have a different element, and that is the fans, right? So if you listen to Joe Buck call a game, all right? And you're a... Uh, oh, please, God, no. <laughs> there you go. Perfect example. So if you're a Yankees fan and a Red Sox fan, right, and you listen to that national broadcast, if you hear him say anything about the Red Sox, you are a Yankees fan, you think this guy's biased to the Red Sox. Vice versa. Yep. So what Chris has ultimately done is cast a light here by taking away the legitimacy of him as a broadcaster. Hmm. It's the easiest thing to do when you want to get your point across is to say, well, obviously they're biased against me. Did you hear how he called that for her, even though I won? Well, the truth is, if you listen to the broadcast then you make that opinion yourself as the listener, as the viewer. So therefore, even though he said those things, that's his opinion. And if you're a Chris Cyborg fan, you think he's going towards her. If you're a fan of, uh, what was it, Katie Van Helms or something? Van Helms. Who the hell was that? <laughs> <laughs> Who was it? Who are you thinking of? I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I just figured there's a, a UFC Katie fighter Katie named Van Katie Van Helms. Oh, boy. <laughs> no, uh, the the opponent in this case was Felicia Spencer. Felicia Spencer. Right. Katie Van Helms. Yeah. Uh. Tomato, potato. <laughs> exactly. Oh, my but, God. Well, again, uh, and, and just to say that, Dana White, she accused of bullying her in the past. In fact, he, he even called her a wonderly silver in a dress. That would be Vanderlei. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> yeah, Katie Van Helms doesn't feel too far off <laughs> now, does it? <laughs> That's uh, why we have you here, Steve, because, uh, yeah, I will mess that up all the time. I've been wondering why I've been here for years. <laughs> but you know, but you see what but you see what we're saying here, Matt. I mean, yes, I mean, 
That's her point, though, is that, all right, now you got the the, yeah, the top know, guy of the company now bullying her. Well, but you said. Is this the first time we've heard this? But see, that's what you just said. He, she said that he was bullying her for years. Mm-hmm. But you just said, now we have. You know what I'm saying? And Simon just hit it on the nail. So if he'd been bullying her for years, then Chris, honey, sweetie pie, boobla, <laughs> why have you stayed with the company so long? Is it because you were making money? Mm-hmm. Mm, maybe. That proverbial fat cash. <laughs> I was waiting for you to say proverbial. Like, thank you. you we almost didn't make the show without you saying it. <laughs> That's actually a new one. Was it? No. Okay. I'm glad uh-huh. you mentioned my fat ass. Oh. Is that what you said? That, you are quite welcome. Oh, feelings, God. feelings. All right. Well, let's go into the second one. We'll uh, we'll have to table that one. <laughs> <laughs> Our second one tonight story. So, guys, guess who showed up at the Lucha Libre AAA this past weekend? Katie Van Halen. Chris. Chris. <laughs> Any other tries you want to get? You guys are all wrong here. Some dude in a black mask with horns. Vel- Velasquez. Yeah. Cain Velasquez. Cain Velasquez. That's right. <laughs> uh, so he made his pro wrestling debut as he was partnered with Psycho Clown and Cody Rhodes. Mm-hmm. And they went against El Texano Jr. <laughs> Tex- <laughs> oh, boy. Tex- Texano? Texiano? Keep going. Keep going. Keep it going. Keep going. Texaco. Tex- <laughs> is it Texaco really? No. Oh, because no. oh, it's not. Okay, never I'll tell mind. You right now, our Spanish speaking people are going to send you a Rosetta Stone. He says, Can you please stop Texano? fucking up? Do you, me, do you need me to call Whatever. Down, do you need me to call down a remote right now? We do. <laughs> Rosetta Stone fucking Spanish. Please, if any of our listeners that, you know. St. Clifton. St. Clifton, <laughs> please. I don't see. Any accents over any letters or anything? Did I? Did I really? Okay, let me keep going. And Killer Cross. Yeah. Oh, you got that right. <laughs> oh, hey, <there's>, hey, <laughs> good job. Good for you. Spanish Whatever. So bad. Good for you. So, <laughs> not only uh, Velasquez team won, but reviews were strong. Now, with the exception of Ronda Rousey and Floyd. And by the way, this story comes from MMAfighting.com. So with the exception of Ronda Rousey and Floyd May- Mayweather and WWE and the former NFL uh, star D'Angelo Williams, Velasquez made probable the most impressive debut of a superstar pro athlete and in going into pro wrestling in more than a decade. So are we going to see more athletes coming from MMA or boxing, football, just to name a few sports? To enter pro wrestling, is that a good thing for wrestling business? And can you argue that it it could possibly take away from those talents that's aspiring and training to only be wrestlers? Uh, Simon Street, what's your take? If the world was only a WWE universe and nobody else exists, yes, they better freaking worry. Mm -hmm. Because Vince McMahon, if he likes them enough and is big enough and he's strong enough, then... Give them the top spot. We don't give two winkle shits of a freaking old man's tit. Mm. But unfortunately, we live in a real world where there's other great promotions and other people who know how to share the pool talent and still be able to showcase somebody. And yes, he did a freaking fantastic job. Yeah. But what people don't realize is th- it's, this is a business. And he didn't just wake up out of bed and become this talented and transition. Right. He, he's been training. And if you even True. read the you're, article you're in it's Las just, Vegas. Yeah, uh, yeah, I don't know about that, but um <laughs> No, I know about it. I read the article. But 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 I will say I will say that 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 at the end of the day he had to do some training. And yes, it probably helped that he already was athletically inclined. Sure. Do you know what I mean? So yeah. it, it, again, you know, I think it's great. I think it's great for anybody who can make that transition from sports into uh, wrestling. So do you think we're going to see more of this happening? We're already seeing it. Okay. 
Not 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 to raise my voice sure. at you. I'm just being honest. We're already seeing it. Sin City Steve. I mean, are we? Uh, is this going to? You know, if we're going to uh, allow this to keep happening, is this going to take away? <laughs> We're saying we as if we're the entire business. Yeah. If we're going we to allow this, it. yeah, we're going to allow it. You're grounded, you MMA people. You're grounded. Well, and remember, not just MMA. You know, and, and maybe someone from boxing or football or maybe basketball. You know, I mean, yeah. Car Malone decided he wanted to, uh, you know, jump in the ring once. So, I mean, it's you tell me what's your take. What what about those that are are not coming from there? That's training, like. The people we talk to the most. I am 100% in support of MMA guys, mm -hmm. gals getting into the wrestling ring. 100%. Um, as long as they're trained properly. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, obviously their first instinct, let's be real, is to follow through with their punches, not potato people, mm -hmm. or two potato people. Um, so as long as one, they can... Un one, one potato people. Right. Three potato. <laughs> anyway... <laughs> Um, five, but no, as potatoes. long as as long as they go through the proper training and and they're not out there hurting uh, the other people that they're in the ring with, uh, legitimately hurting them, then I'm completely fine with it. Yeah. Um, something that we need to we need to understand as professional wrestling fans is that this business is always evolving and it is always changing. Um, if the last twenty years have taught us anything, it's that stagnation is not good, and. Mm -hmm. That mm. uh, you know, we we witnessed a, a a great show here in Vegas, um, the Natural Born Killers show, where it was a hybrid show um, where MMA and professional wrestling collided. Mm -hmm. uh, the rules were, you know, they they were they were a hybrid uh, of pro wrestling and MMA rules, mm -hmm. and I I believe that there's definitely a place for that in the current landscape of things and you know if uh if kane velasquez wants to go and you know train for for professional wrestling and you know hit uh hurricane ranas and german suplexes and all this other cool shit um more power to the guy i mean he he's not going to be able to be at a main event status uh with with the ufc anymore um mm -hmm. but that's not to say that his overall um, combat sporting career is finished. Um, so it's it's great that the ever changing landscape is wide open enough to where you know he can show up at a AAA event and have an amazing debut like he did because that's just going to build his brand even further. Right. And yeah, there's there's definitely room for these these crossover guys that, you know, maybe are leaving the NFL or maybe leaving the UFC or, you know, any other kind of combat sports um, to enter into pro wrestling. Because keep in mind, for the longest time, they've gone after amateur wrestling uh, people that really haven't done too much of anything else. Mm. So for them to now get people that have some name value... It, it's nothing but a win. So, uh, M Matt Michaels, I mean, is it just because of the name? That's it? That's the only reason why we're going to go after uh, a retired MMA fighter or a retired football player who now wants to get into wrestling? Let's uh, let's put them on because of their name. Is that what your take would be on this? Well, it's, uh, there's a couple things. Um, but let's, let's start. I mean, because what about the other guys who don't have a name who is – trying to move up into the positions that they're going right into because of their name. Well, first of all, okay. the first thing's first. How can you prove it was Cain Velasquez? <laughs> Take off his mask. He was wearing a mask. Take his mask off. You know, okay. Conspiracy right. theory right there. <laughs> right. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, he was Kurt Angle. <laughs> Jesus. So the next thing is he's smart for one reason. There's a little company that started up, and its uh, initials uh, sound like A and W, <laughs> but there's an E in the middle where the and symbol is. Okay, I thought you were about to say root beer, but okay, I got that's it. what I'm saying. Yeah, it's yeah, yeah. it's like the root beer, but uh, I got an E you. instead of the and. Right. Well, if AEW does know that he can wrestle, wouldn't you think they'd love to have? The guy who beat Brock Lesnar? Bingo. 
<laughs> in a shoot fight on their roster. And don't you think Vince McMahon will have a fucking cow shit mother fucking <laughs> piss fest in the I'd hate to be in the office if that goes down. Because mm-hmm. you know Vince is just going to be just upset and pissed Son off. Son of a yeah. bitch. Everything. He'll be like Kylo Ren and just start tearing shit up. Yeah. So, I mean, there there is a inherent value to him for that reason only. Mm. Is that he actually beat Brock Lesnar. If right. he would have beaten, you know, someone else in the UFC, uh, and he transfers to, then it would be just like anyone else, right? But because he beat Brock Lesnar, there's a value to him. Mm-hmm. Also, I think we're missing out on what I figure is a bigger story. Okay. And that is that one of the people he was wrestling against mm-hmm. was Kevin Cross. Yep. Mm-hmm. That's true. Yeah. Well, what's even more so true, and that you probably didn't know, is that TNA was in California doing some tapings yesterday and today mm. and Friday. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. But Mr. Cross is down in uh, AAA. <laughs> Uh-oh. Yeah. Mm. So, Got some huh. explaining them to you. Mm. So, I mean, obviously, yeah. he, he probably was given the time because uh, you can't just bail out. Right. But it is interesting because... Well, there's uh, been rumors anyway, right? Well, surrounding there, there there is a lot of different rumors, sure, rumor on, has but it. it's just rumors yeah it's yeah. just that um yeah. but you know the what's interesting is that the focus was on on kane sure mm-hmm. and you know then that story kind of got lost no one picks up on the fact that cross was doing a triple a event a big triple a event right too. yeah so um in the end you know, really what it comes down to is if you have the personality for pro wrestling, you already have the athletic ability, right? Right. So if the personality transcends, then why not give it a shot? If you happen to get that shot just based on your name, and you don't have the personality, then you are taking away someone's spot. Mm. Okay. But if you have the athletic skill and the personality and mm-hmm. the, the mic skill, then, you know, what, I mean, why can't you, you already built your brand up. Why can't you transfer? Serena Williams comes into a, a wrestling ring. Are you going to tell me? Oh, but Serena, you're you're taking away the spot from, you know, this young girl who's been trying so hard. But if Serena Williams, you know, we know she can talk. We know she's a fantastic, you know, personality. Mm-hmm. And if she can do a, a fucking 350 frog splash, you know, from the <laughs> right, top right. of the, the building, then, yeah. you know, well, fuck. I'd love to see that, <laughs> by the way. <laughs> <laughs> but notice, saying. see, it's not the 360. She's only doing it's a 350. 350. No, you got a point there. But yeah. even still, I'm, it, just her in a wrestling ring, <laughs> yeah, I, I'm so cool for. It'd be fucking awesome. It'd be, like, it'd be like seeing Linda Miles with talent. Yeah, look that up, tough enough people. <laughs> uh-huh. Freaking Matt Michaels with his Cracker Jack freaking questionnaires. Yeah, that's right. Keeping us on our toes. Look at well, you. Well, there you go, man. I mean, I, I, I see where you guys are coming from. Did you have any one more thing you want to add, or you're good? I'm good, actually. Okay. You can segue to the next one. I will do that. Uh, we'll table this one. Oh, we've been tabling a lot. <laughs> Just want to put you. That's out because there. we're not going to table any of them. That's because we got rid of the meat. <laughs> so we got more room on the table. All right, so our third story comes from WrestlingInc.com. <clears throat> and apparently this was on Jericho's podcast. Our favorite MJF says yeah. characters make cash in pro wrestling, not flips. This is a quote. He says, there's a lot of guys on our roster that can do their f- flippy dudes and their cool little moves. And that's cute. That doesn't create cash. What creates cash is controversy. What creates cash is characters. I say someone that creates intrigue 
someone that takes you to the edge of your seat that you have to listen to. So my question, fellas, is MJF correct? After all, I mean, he's got his character down and he's making cash, not doing flips. What do y'all take on that? Boom. Uh, I would say that he is mostly correct. I do think, and it, it's, it's an. I wouldn't even say it's unfortunate. It just makes sense. You, you want, you want to be able to captivate your audience. But that's not without saying that if you're able to captivate your audience, you're able to do great promos, you're able to just have a great package as your character. If you lack the athletical talent, that's a problem, I think, to a certain degree. Mm -hmm. um, do you need to do the flippy do's? I think the flippy do, the people who do do the flippy do's, um, if you look at the larger percentage, even going back way back in WCW, you know, the cruiserweights are, and, 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 you know, I never really found them to be some of the most charismatic people in the world. But again, I always felt like they overcame that with their aerials and the crazy things that they do. But it, to yeah, answer but his question, char charismatic versus <clears throat> character. I, thank you, sir. Mm. Thank you. You're mm. right. But I think, you know, to kind of answer this question is, is I think that where the business is going right now, I think that could you survive as a person who does flippy do's and not have the character, I don't see it in the long term. That's just my opinion. I just don't see it in the long term. And I'm going to say Ricochet. I love watching Ricochet. And, I'm, and, and even though we're talking about a, you know AEW. Sure. Right. But, but, but Ricochet is a perfect example. There's nothing that that man can't do, in my opinion. But <laughs> really have a chance to really step out and create a character, a captivation. I mean, it sucks when you know your video was more captivating than your promos. And I'm not talking about the flippity do video package. And I'm not trying to stick them in the eye, but I'm just saying, like, at the end of the day, we need to find something for a lot of these aerial guys to kind of grasp to. Because if not, long term, I just don't see it. Uh, Sin City Steve. So, um, Ricochet, oh, mm -hmm. okay. So, um, does he not create cash? If he does, if he's not creating cash, um, Young Bucks, mm -hmm. they're creating cash, yep. right? So, does he have a point or not have a point here? So I, I think that what it comes down to is we're looking we're looking at the business through two two lenses. One macro, one micro. So what I okay. mean by that is obviously you want something that if you're just flipping through the channels, which people do mm -hmm. on a daily basis, if they happen to to scroll through and see, you know, let's say the Young Bucks or, you know, Jungle Boy or you know, any anybody that does the aerial moves mm -hmm. and they're flashy, that is that that's that's a good kind of um, attention grabber. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's going to get somebody possibly to stop scrolling through and see just what the hell's going on. Right. Okay. Um, now that's going to be looking at things through through. A micro perspective in a very in a very small um, kind of a lens. Okay, mm -hmm. what keeps people around is developing an emotional investment in the characters. So, I think that you you can bring people in by doing the flippity do stuff and mm -hmm. and you know everything that MJF saying there. Um, but what's going to keep them around is if those same people can make you um, show emotion, if they can get you to buy into them, mm -hmm. and if they can develop an emotional attachment with you as a viewer, with them as the on-screen talent. That's the macro lens. So short term, yes, flippity doos can create cash. But on a macro level, on a larger scale, right, it comes to being a character that people can get behind. Because professional wrestling, as we all know, is probably one of, if not the best medium of telling long, engaging, drawn-out storylines that sometimes take years. Where you can follow someone's entire career lineage mm -hmm. and see them grow, develop, and change over time. Matt Michaels, I was at uh, Double or Nothing here in, in, in Vegas, and where are you now? 
I was. Wow. In fact, I was here with Simon Street. Hmm. What? He was there too? He was I there. Was too. there. <laughs> yeah. Oh, wow. I, I think hey, so. guys, I was there too. Oh, wait, that's right. You were oh. there too. Yeah. He just didn't want to sit by us. Yeah, that's what it was. You know, Anyways. You know why? Because oh. they were too sexy. Fuck off. <laughs> so, Matt here. Um, this is anger. <laughs> MJF was a part of the Casino Battle Royal. Okay, he was a part of that at the beginning of the show. Uh-huh. I mean, he's in there with 30 other people. like, okay. I mean, he's in there, but who's paying attention of MJF? He then, later in the show, comes out, boom, grabbed it, had the entire arena grand at his attention. When He wasn't doing anything of no flippy dudes at all. But he had our attention. It looked like he might have a point here. What's your take on this? I mean, he looked like, because I'm going to tell you, I didn't know much about him going in. But now that I am more familiar with him, yeah, he could definitely take my cash because he is entertaining. What's your take? Well, there is, uh, I I think he's right. Mm -hmm. I think he's uh, very right. Uh, Hulk Hogan, remember that guy? I do. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Um, the so, guy? <laughs> yes. Um, so, my favorite moment of Hulk Hogan's career was when he did that Huda Karana, and then he did the the 350 frog splash. Yeah, I remember that. Sure. Yeah. So, um, now, the uh, there's also, little known, uh, this guy was um, Rick... Uh, Fleer, mm. something like that. Fulilier. Fulilier. Like yeah. Yeah. yeah, I think he was French. Um, <laughs> and, you know, uh, there was, you know, his big finish was the... Uh, top rope. Top rope. Yeah, he did the top rope. He would uh, spin five times in the air. Sure. <laughs> uh, and then land it across the ring. Um, I, get, so, I, get, I get what you're saying. Yeah, I mm-hmm. know. I mean, he, you know, he was, he was good. Yeah. Um, uh, that uh the one actor dude who went into wrestling for a while uh Dwayne oh the pebble mm. the pebble yes the pebble yeah. <laughs> um he was another one who just you know his aerial skills were fucking amazing yes, they, yes yeah he was. They, they but were. you know what they were all lacking was uh character <laughs> <laughs> see now i think those guys would have got big if they would have got character wow my man okay <laughs> my man <laughs> so Church. <laughs> I'm just saying. For me, it's kind of hard because I love those aerial artists. But yeah. if they just had more character, I think I would probably appreciate them more, <laughs> and maybe even remember their names occasionally. That's true. So, um, and you know what? And MJF, uh, I'll give him he, what MJF does. And I know that it's been said out there. It's very Andy Kaufman esque. Mm-hmm. And he continues to play the character. In uh, at Starcast the whole weekend, he was getting kicked out of <clears throat> events. <laughs> <laughs> right? Yeah, because he was stirring up, you know, and pointing out the security, even though the security was the ADW security who was dragging him out. It's fucking brilliant. It is brilliant. <laughs> so, you know, the, the thing is, is character is where your money is. Yeah. Um, talent in terms of being able to do moves like that um translates uh look at a guy like rob van dam right yeah great talent and and a big character and personality now if 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 rob didn't have that character and personality to him he would have just been robbie v Mm, sure you know what i'm saying um you know eddie guerrero Hey, mm-hmm. Guerrero, if he didn't have that personality, mm-hmm. he would have just been another guy who would have never gotten the, the opportunity or the break. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> Chris Benoit had to, you know, go to, uh, you know, even did he, he, even though he did aerial stuff, he did a lot of that stuff in Japan under a mask. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because true. he didn't have character, mm-hmm. yeah. you know, uh, the personality to do it. So, I mean, there, you know, you're going to see the examples. And by the way, the best thing out of all of this is the fact that MJF did this whole thing being his character. I know. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. So you're getting people to talk about this. That's exactly what he wants you to do. Mm hmm. So, um, you know, in the end, it's like your, your talent out there, um, you're, you're going to have people who are great talent and, and can do things. But at the same time, the, the people who can translate it into a character 
are going to be the more successful people in the end because there is a couple advantages. One, people won't forget you. Two, you don't have to do nearly half the shit to mm-hmm. kill your body. Yeah. So you can have a longer career, essentially. And that's what it comes down to. Man. Yeah. I, 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 I just give them all the credit for creating the character base that will allow him to, when eyes get on him in the uh, weekly TV format, mm-hmm. he's going to be, you know, like everyone, you know, Kenny Omega, Kenny Omega, Kenny Omega. <laughs> right. Well, Omega. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, stop shaking the table, Lucky. Oh, you're not here. What happened? <laughs> so, you know, MJF is going to get a lot of garner, a lot of attention. Yeah. And in the end, the best thing about it, look at Roddy Piper. Mm-hmm. Mm. Roddy Piper mm. never had to do flippity doos. Right. Um, because people, you know, hated him. Yep. And then people loved him. So, and also, uh, you know, that also takes me to Ring of Honor. Mm, mm -hmm. And I think that, uh, you know, you got guys there like uh, Character Gordon. (laughs) Go ahead. (laughs) You've been trying all freaking day. Right. (laughs) All day. Just keep up with it, man. <laughs> we're not we're not tripping on our shoestrings today, right? <laughs> you do, you but do. that's pretty much what you're. I get what you're saying, though. Well, the fact of the matter is, the guy's character name is Flip Gordon yeah. because he does flips. <laughs> right. Yeah, but you yeah. say character Gordon. I know. Yeah, <laughs> because that's, that's his joke. character. Yeah, oh, yeah. Right. That's, that's his character. But that's the point. I got you. The point is, is that the guy who does flippity do shit. His character is the guy who does flippity do shit. Yeah. And he's the only one who's actually taken that and just been like, well, I might as well call myself fucking flip because that's what I do. Well, and, and, and that's something I forgot to add, and I'm glad you said it, was I think that it's great that, and it's not just with AEW, I think it's kind of across the board. I got a lot of people with the rhetoric of, you know, uh, we don't do flips, we don't do that flippy shit. I think that's great because then what it will probably give birth is more people who do the flippy do's to actually start cultivating more character. Yeah. And then you'll probably, I don't know if we'll call them a hybrid or whatever the hell you want to call them, but I think that would be make for some more interesting uh, uh, shows coming up in the future. What do you guys think? Sorry if I posed the question. I was just curious. Uh, do anyone care to uh, answer Simon Street? No, I, I agree, man. I think that... Uh I think that we're on the verge of seeing a lot of changes to the business. I'm really excited for it. Um, I think that one thing that astounds me is just how good MJF really, truly mm-hmm. is. Yeah, It's not a gimmick to him. No. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it, the guy lives the gimmick. He he is the future of this business. Yeah. Uh, if, he, if he stays on the trajectory that he's on, he will never need to do a flip in his career mm-hmm. and he will be great i believe it you know what they say if paul Heyman was a wrestler he'd be this guy oh oh okay i'm just being honest in my head you know, hey yeah kind of feel the same way about him i didn't know they said that yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they're saying it now they population simon Street. there you go <laughs> i think also <laughs> one of uh one of the <laughs> The biggest factors that you, the reason that you see the guys doing the flips and because it's the style that's coming from Japan and from Lucha. Mm -hmm. Well, the thing is in Japan and Lucha, the characters don't necessarily have to get over through their talking. That's true. Mm -hmm. The you know it's right. it's very limited with talking. Right. Um, it's more so in the ring style. Right, right. And then you can base that character off your ring style. So um, one of the the biggest things to me is that when you have a fan base who want to see that stuff, you're going to have the fan base eventually burn out on it. Yeah. Because at some point. You're gonna have seen every single flip there is to do, right? Mm-hmm. And then what happens? Yeah, 
I mean, unless you speak Japanese or, uh, you know, <laughs> Spanish, uh, you know, the, the, it's, it, yeah, I, I, you know, I, I just, to me, there's something to be said if you can create a character that all you have to do is make a simple motion in the middle of the ring. When Hoyan used to make that face when he was put in the rest hold, <laughs> like he was going to sleep, right. and he made the saddest looking <laughs> motherfucking face you've ever seen in your life. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, that hand went up and the finger started waving because he wasn't going down for that third time. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Didn't need to do a fucking moonsault to fucking right. get over with the crowd. Yeah. So. Good points, man. That's three count, guys. Good job. Uh, when we come back, we're going to get into our interview next with Kevin Kleinrock, which is exciting. I can't wait for us to, uh, to have our interview with him. And after that, we're going to continue our talk a little bit about SummerSlam. And then, Matt, I know you have uh, some words about the passing of Harley Race. And any other comments you all want to make to end the show, we'll let you do that. We also want to mention about our live show. Let's talk about that, too, that we had with RVD. We can thank everybody as well. So we'll be back in just a moment. What's up, y'all? This is Sin City Steve, just urging you to join us, the Vegas Bad Boys of Podcasting, as we are going to be at ROH, Death Before Dishonor, on September the 27th, live from Sam's Town here in Las Vegas, Nevada. Bell time is 6 p.m., and the very next night, September the 28th, there will be a live international TV taping Again, September 27th and 28th, live at Sam's Town. Come check out Ring of Honor. Hey everybody, this is Matt Michaels, and I'm encouraging you to check out Vampiro's Lucha Fight Club. They'll be having a live event August 23rd, 24th, 25th, and 26th at the Rio Hotel and Casino right here in Las Vegas. If you're looking for some great Lucha Libre action, Vampiro's Lucha Fight Club is the place to be. We'll be there, will you? Meltzer is a journalist. Well, we're just the entertainment. You're listening to Vegas Bad Boys of Podcast. You know nothing, Jon Snow. Man, we have a, a real good special guest on the line. You know, we, we we get a lot of people we get to interview, but no one at the ex, at the level that we have now. And I'm excited. Let me give him the proper uh, introduction. First off, as a director of digital operations and partner development at Viz Media, also the president and CEO. OO at Mask Republic. It's got a retail company, Lucha Loot. Got a magazine, Rudo Can't Fail. It's got a clothing brand, LuchaShop.com. I mean, the man is really sitting up here working hard. Vegas Bad Boys welcomes Kevin Klein Rock. <laughs> thanks, for, thanks for having me on, guys. It's quite, quite the intro. <laughs> well you know what he had to he had to take that dramatic reading of your name because he had to cue the audience to stand up and start clapping so yeah now i'm telling the audience to sit back down and wait to the end and they can clap when we're all finished <laughs> no doubt man so kevin um just for a little bit uh you know listeners who don't know about you um you could just tell us a little bit about how you got into wrestling was it something that uh was a passion of yours since you were a kid and uh, what fueled your love of the business uh yeah so um so when i was like a, a young young kid um you know like elementary school age I, I didn't really follow wrestling um like i was always interested in it when i saw it was on you know, flipping channels or uh, if I was, you know, a friend's house or something, but, uh, I didn't really follow it. I didn't really, um, you know, uh, know exactly what was going on. And my older cousin was into it. So like 
at his house sometimes would be on, or I'd see a WWF magazine. Um, <laughs> and it, then right around 12 years old, so this was during the buildup to like WrestleMania 7, yeah. uh, I started to become fairly obsessed with uh, with wrestling, um, I would, I, you know, I finally figured out. Okay, I, I'm from Los Angeles, and so I, I finally figured out. All right, it's on Fox at 12 noon on Saturdays and Sundays, unless <laughs> uh, it's baseball season, and then it's getting bumped all around. Um, and I started just kind of picking up uh, all the newsstand magazines, which you know back then was like, it, you know, you could find two or three of them really easily. WWF magazine, Pro Wrestling Illustrated, yeah, uh, yeah. maybe like Sports Review Wrestling. And then there were other newsstands I would find later that had like all the Napolitano magazines and then even more magazines. Yeah. Uh, but uh, it was really, it was watching WrestleMania 7. But, so we didn't have cable growing up. So that also made it hard to watch wrestling, right? Because yeah. we didn't have during the, the big boom um, or during like the 80s boom, I didn't have access to it. Yeah. Um, but my best friend, they had cable. And so they would order the pay-per-views, which was a lot easier back then when it started with like one pay-per-view a year, yeah, no two care. pay-per-views a year. Um, but so every year I go over uh, to watch WrestleMania. I think I'm pretty sure we watched WrestleMania six there. Um, I was a huge Ultimate Warrior fan at the time because <laughs> you know most people watching wrestling back then, regardless of the thoughts on the guy today, uh, were big Warrior fans or Hogan fans. Um, but I specifically remember it was watching WrestleMania 7. It was watching the, the uh, Warrior Savage match and 12 years old. And I was like, this is what I want to do with my life. Yeah. Um, I knew that I was scrawny and I did not like getting hurt. So I did not want to be a wrestler. <laughs> uh, but you know, I had no, no problems admitting that then. No problems admitting, now nah, I'm not so scrawny anymore because uh, I'm older uh, and a little bit heavier. But uh, still don't like pain. <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, and at the time, yeah, I had no idea how wrestling works. Like, yes, you know, I knew that it was, it was quote scripted. Um, but I, my goal in life at that point was to become president of the WWF, Jack Tunney, and make the matches. <laughs> yeah. that's, that's what I wanted to do. Uh, and, and the, the funny thing is, is even though we laugh about that now, in the end, that's really kind of what I did want to do, but I wanted to be a writer, booker, producer, right. um, which was still making the matches and writing the stories and determining who was going to face each other. But it, you know, wasn't, I had no idea at that point that Jack Tunney was this figurehead president. Right. Um, yeah. And, but, but from that point on, literally every day of my life became about figuring out how I could work in wrestling. And, and I started just diving into everything. I would record, you know, superstars and challenge on the weekends on VHS tape and watch them over and over. I was reading every magazine I could. Um, <clears throat> and eventually, um, uh, I think so many people over the years I know have, have did the same thing. But in Pro Wrestling Illustrated magazine, there was an ad for a, it. Was, it was called a book, but it was not really a book. It was more of like a expanded pamphlet or something uh, uh, by Percy Pringle and Dennis Brent. And it was called So You Want to Be a Pro Wrestler. And <laughs> it was basically like the insider's guide to how to break into the wrestling business. And it was like, I don't know, 20 bucks or 15 bucks or whatever it was back then. This would have been, you know, the mid 90s. Yeah. Um, and, or early 90s, actually. Um, and so I, I don't remember if in the ad it said, like, includes how to be other things too or not. But so I sent away and I got the little the, the book. Uh, and it just so happened that in the back of the book, there was a list of all of the wrestling schools. And, you know, I mean, it was, there probably were more wrestling schools, but even then, in the early 90s, there weren't nearly as many as there are today. Right. The business was still so close. Um, and it just so happened that one of them, uh, Slammer's Wrestling Gym, was just a few miles from my parents' house in Van Nuys. Nice. And, um, and so I... I I was I was probably fourteen maybe at the time and super super nervous and like finally got up the nerve to call the number uh, probably just to be able to ask like so how do I get in wrestling and it said the number was disconnected and my oh, heart broke and man. I was like that's it I'm never gonna figure out how to break into pro wrestling and 
turns out uh, I went to what at the time we called the white pages, <laughs> which is a phone book, uh, and I was like, let me see, maybe the number changed. Turned out they printed the number wrong by one digit. Hey, and go figure. So, uh, <laughs> it actually was still there, uh, and I called up and found out that not only was it a rest in school, but they also ran events. Um, I think at that time it was like on the first Sunday of every month. And begged and pleaded with my parents to take me to a show. And uh, my mom still to this day cannot stand watching wrestling. <laughs> uh, they, they took me to a show. And ironically, you know, I met you guys through uh, a mutual friend who goes by the name of Raven. Yep. Uh, and he, I didn't even know. I, said, I think he, I don't, I know that he did some training there. But I don't know if it was before I went the first time or if it was after. I like went as a fan, but before I started working there, um, but this was like the place in Southern California, especially in the LA area to go and get trained. Um, you know, at, at various times they had guest trainers like Sam Houston or Terry Funk. Um, but it was, it was, uh, a gentleman by the name of Vern Langdon, um, yeah. yep. who had, who had done some wrestling and was all his, like his career outside of wrestling was in Hollywood doing, um, movie makeup and monster makeup and, and, and things like that. Uh, so he was just super connected anyway. Uh, fabulous Mula had a, had a, a role there at some point. Um, and not only was it Slammer's wrestling gym, but it was an museum. So the first thing you do when you walk into this place is it's literally this little kind of lobby. Uh, and it's just got eight by ten in every square inch of the wall. Wow. And my jaw just, like, hit the floor. Wow. I was like, this is, like, the coolest thing I've ever <laughs> seen in my life. There's all these all these 8x10 photos of wrestlers. And then when they let you in for the show, it's literally just, like, your typical industrial space, which if anyone knows about wrestling schools these days, most of them are in these places. Yeah. Little yeah. front lobby and then just a warehouse. Yep. Um, but in this warehouse, not only did they have the ring, and a couple rows of chairs, maybe to fit 50 people comfortably, but they actually had this little wrestling museum. They had Gorgeous George uh, outfit and, and Terry Funk boots and Fabulous Moolah outfit and just really cool uh, memorabilia. Um, and so I was instantly hooked. I was like, this is, <laughs> this is the place for me. Um, and so every now and then I was able to convince my dad, my mom never wanted to go back, uh, I was able to convince my dad to take me to shows there. Um, and then right around, the, I think it was around the time I was 16, um, they had this little souvenir program, which was like, you know, you paid a dollar or 25 cents or whatever it was. And it was just this kind of photocopied folded thing that had like uh, the card for the day, or right. maybe a, a, a letter from the quote president and <laughs> ads for their VHS tapes or whatever. And I was like, I'm going to... I'm going to write a column of the results, but from a heel perspective, and I'm just going to, without my name on it, I'm going to mail it in and just see if like the guy likes it. And maybe, maybe somehow like I'll just keep sending this in and I'll, I'll get my foot in the door or whatever. Um, <laughs> and I went to the next show and bought the souvenir program and right there on the back, he had printed my column <laughs> and, it was literally like the coolest day of my life up to that point. Um, uh, I don't remember if he knew right away who it was or figured it out, um, but that's kind of how I first, very, very first got my foot in the door wrestling. Um, and then from there, it was like just literally doing everything I could. From that, I became the timekeeper there. And then one day the ring announcer didn't show up. So he was like, guess what, Kevin? You're the ring announcer now. I was like, <laughs> Okay. Uh, and so this was all about the time that I was, I was 15, 16 years old. Um, and then my senior year of high school, uh, I was a student body treasurer. And so it enabled me to, uh, suggest fundraisers and stuff for the school. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> Slammers was always advertising, you know, Hey, let us come to your school and do a fundraiser and, and put on a wrestling show. So I got my first taste of co-promoting, uh, and I was guaranteed that I was going to get 10% of the gate. Now, the school probably didn't know about that, and uh, <laughs> it, probably, it, probably, it probably wasn't right, but uh, also, 
my school wasn't a normal local high school. Um, it was a, it was a magnet school, so kids were bussed in from all over. Uh-huh. And turns out, not a very good idea to do a wrestling show after school when there is no way to get home oh. after oh. Oh. if you don't get on the bus. Oh. Oh. So that that giant ten percent that I was supposed to make ended up being a check for a whopping three dollars and some cents, oh. which oh. I have somewhere frame i can't find the frame now and it really upsets me but somewhere in my life i have a frame check for three dollars and some on <laughs> cents which is the first money i ever made in pro wrestling uh and uh yeah so long story long that's kind of how i got my foot in the door <laughs> that's i mean that's fabulous it's fascinating because you know the What's interesting about it is that i think that all of us who have some kind of experience in wrestling have a different path like no one no one has the same story how they got involved which is amazing sure, yeah. um and especially too i mean slammers i grew up in chicago but i still knew of slammers it's like they had a reputation even in the days of non-internet which is mm-hmm. you know amazing to to hear that that story and to hear the you know the uh, the description of the uh the museum the history there it's just it's amazing and it's a shame too that when you say that like that the wwe hasn't translated their hall of fame into a physical facility yet yeah absolutely you know or even in la man you know like i always thought someone should have bought the um the olympic stadium because that's mm-hmm. where they had all those great wrestling cards for years and years and years. Well, they, they someone bought it, but then they turned well, it into a church. Yeah, so. exactly. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, yeah, I, I would have loved to have seen that, you know, become a wrestling museum. Yeah. It would have been a, a phenomenal thing. And we're gonna circle back there in a little bit because there was something that I got to talk about that happened at that arena. But we'll get that in a little bit. <laughs> um, but you know, leading up to that. Um, you were involved uh, with X, uh, XPW, and um, how? I mean, how necessarily were you involved? And um, you know, what what was the stages of the beginning? Were you there from the beginning with Rob? And uh, I'll get into some questions yeah. about what it was like in a little bit. <laughs> well, so okay, so here's the the fast forward from Slammers. So uh, Slammer is like it's still. Early mid nineties by that point because I graduated high school in ninety six so okay. we're talking like ninety four ninety five internet still just like like I liked babysitting the kids next door because next door they had Prodigy and so at <laughs> night when the kids went to sleep I got to get on like Rec Sports Pro Wrestling and like the wrestling news boards and stuff um, <laughs> but so still a very very close business and uh, Vern uh, who I will always owe a huge debt of gratitude for letting me get my foot in the door well he was still very old school. And so even though I was writing for the program, I was a ring announcer, when they were doing their um, like pre-show stuff in the, in the ring area, I wasn't allowed back there. Uh, I was okay. in the lobby and not allowed to really learn the inner workings of the business yet. Okay. Um, and so I was going to be turning 18, going off to college, and I knew that if I ever wanted to really have a career in wrestling, I was going to have to get inside and not just stay on the outside. And so I told Vern that I was leaving so that I could concentrate on college. Um, I was staying locally in LA with UCLA. Um, but I was just going to kind of take a step away from wrestling for the time being. Well, while that was all happening, um, there was a number of wrestlers at Slammers, including Dynamite D, who people yep. would know potentially from XPW, yep. uh, and some of the others who were kind of getting frustrated with the way Slammers ran. Um, You did shows uh, at that point every Thursday night, no matter what the Thursday night was, whether it was Thanksgiving or Christmas or New Year's, it was very old school. (laughs) And they're driving to Bakersfield, um, which is about 90 minutes outside of L.A., and doing these shows, and no one's making money. Uh, And on top of that, people weren't upset necessarily about not making money, but Vern was also very restrictive and, like, didn't want the guys wrestling for other places. Yeah. And so when you combine, I mean, our industry is so different now, you know, 25 years later. Um, but back then, you know, that was a, that was a standard line. Um, and so a lot of people, Dynamite D included, were, were getting frustrated. And D decided to stage this 
Dynamite World Order, uh, yeah. obviously inspired by the NWO. <laughs> yeah. uh, kind of kind of hostile takeover at a Slammers wrestling show. A uh, bunch of the guys who were former Slammers people who had quit, a bunch of guys who were on that show that was going to be going on, were basically going to rebel and, you know, create this DWO thing. Now, the way it had always been explained to me, which I found out many, many years later might not have been the actual case, um, but the way that D had always explained it to me was essentially he thought it was going to go one of two ways. Um, either Vern was going to go, let's run with it and let's try to, you know, because at that point they weren't just doing shows in the Flammers wrestling gym, excuse me, building. They had actually started renting out my high school gym and running shows there every month because wow. they liked the area. It was a bigger size venue. So they were drawing, you know, I don't know, 100, 200 people or whatever. Um, and so it was on one of these shows. And, uh, so if, and if, and D thought if he wasn't going to go for it, he'd just ignore it. And that would be that. Well, what happened somewhere, and again, this is where I don't exactly know what happened because Vern later accused me of, of not being, you know, truthful. And I'm like, dude, I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> um, but somewhere in that, there was a huge split between D and Vern, and Slammers went one way, and then D and Ed Ferreira. Uh, who would go on to write for WWE and WCW, right. um, myself, and Patrick Hernandez, who was a referee in the Los Angeles area, uh, would kind of go on and form uh, Southern California Championship Wrestling, which was going to be our own indie fed. Um, it used a lot of former Slammers guys and then a lot of other just kind of local L.A. talent. Um, and so in late 90s, yeah, like 96, 97 we were doing SCCW. Um, we were running, you know, local boys and girls clubs, YMCAs, you know, and drawing 50, 150 people. Um, nothing big. Um, but we we would always advertise heavily and so anytime WWE was in town, we'd go fly a crew, do it old school the way most people should do these days, but everyone just relies on the internet. Uh, and so if you went to a WWE event at the time, a WWF event at the time, you probably got one of our flyers, either on your car <laughs> or at, you know, at an exit or whatever. So at that point in time, Rob Black uh, had known about WWF, known about WCW, and through um, a random, really, occurrence of um, a signing at an adult bookstore or something like that, uh, had ended up meeting um, uh, the Dudley boys, uh, Bubba and, and Big Big Dudley. And through that, met Paul Heyman, and they um, were talking about doing some business together. And <laughs> so Rob had started to learn a little bit about outside wrestling, but still had no idea that there was this whole world of independent wrestling, even like lower than ECW. Right. Um, and so... He was at a WWF event one night and ended up getting a flyer for an SCCW show. Um, and knowing that he was thinking about potentially starting to do something on the West Coast, be it the West Coast promoter for ECW um, or just something different, he ended up calling the number on the flyer and talking to, I don't remember, I think it was D. Um, it was either D or Patrick. Okay. Um, and was like, hey, thinking about doing some wrestling in the L.A. area, did not realize that anybody else was doing wrestling in the L.A. area. <laughs> you know, why don't, why don't we sit down and talk? Um, you know, one of the things that I always laugh about is that, so we were supposed to be doing um, a show that he was going to attend. Um, and thankfully, <laughs> I say, for my history, uh, it was at the Echo Park Boys and Girls Club, and we got a call, like, the morning of or the day before or something, that the show had to be canceled because of a threat of gang violence in the area. <laughs> uh, Echo Park, not the best area. Now it's kind of become a little bit hipster. Yeah. But back in the 90s, not, not the best area. Well, this turned out to be a blessing in disguise because we were scared as hell that Rob was actually going to come to the show and see that it was this little, really, I mean, still, look, we all knew what we were doing and we all had talent. <laughs> but if you went to the SCCW show, Rob would have, there would have never been an XCW. Yeah. Uh, at least not what it was um, in terms of, you know, uh, what, it, what it became. Um, so 
yeah. So thankfully that show got canceled. Um, I had no idea who Rob Black was or, or anybody that was involved with that. But Patrick um, was very up on, he actually worked in the, in the video industry, like the general video industry. So right. he was very well aware of all sorts of video industry related stuff. Right. Um, he, he knew of Rob and, and Tommy. Um, and so we went to a meeting at a TGI Friday <laughs> and we <laughs> sat there and we talked, we talked for, um, I don't know, a few hours, I think this was my, this was the end of my second year of college. So this was the end of 98. Okay. Um, and at that point, Rob was still trying to figure out, am I going to do something with Paul and, and DCW? Because uh, at the time, also, Rob had a company in uh, Brazil, and he was talking about um, maybe also doing some ECW stuff with Paul in Brazil. <laughs> and, and so this went on for about a year. Um, uh, or maybe, I guess not about a year, but a good nine months. Um, yeah. And... We had brought uh, Sheldon Goldberg, um, who is a uh, well-known and respected promoter out of out of the Boston area, who was kind of like like when I started going to Cauliflower Alley Club banquets when I was um, you know in that era. I right. go with the uh, with the guys from um, from Slammers and stuff, and so I met uh, a lot of promoters from all over the place. Who you know for for the fact that I was this teenage kid just trying to figure out how to get into the business. Um, you know, they were they were really cool. Sorry, I'm home and my dog's barking. Uh, <laughs> they were really really cool to me. Um, and so we had flown Sheldon out to uh, consult um, and kind of you know give Rob a little bit of a general big overview of independent wrestling and some advice. And and uh, Sheldon was actually the one that came up with the name XPW. But the original idea for XPW was that the X was just going to be that an X. It wasn't going to stand for extreme. It was going to be like the X Factor, like this, this okay. wrestling promotion that just had the X Factor, which is funny because later that kind of became the X Division thing in, right. in the Impact or in yeah. TNA. But so that was the idea. But um, what happened was as ECW um, started to uh, uh, make their their inroads into uh, being on on TNT, right? Um, Ra, uh, Paul started to get into this i don't know rob i don't i have no connection with this company i don't i am right. clean as a whistle over here right. uh and that pissed rob off and and i remember it because um i got back to the office after a lunch meeting one day and he was like that's it we're doing this we're starting this you know soon <sighs> and screw it we're we're calling it extreme it's going to be extreme professional wrestling forget about it <laughs> XPW. uh and so, yeah, I, I was there not just from the beginning. Yeah, I was there before the beginning. Yeah, um, that's and, amazing. Uh, and then from that decision on, we did our first show in uh, July of, of 99. 99, and, uh, yep. It was a, a few crazy years after that. Well, I, I, uh, I was there. Um, I was there with uh, three of my friends. And um, it was... Uh, it was uh, Tim Fisher. Uh, uh, yeah. Yeah. Versus uh, Big Dick Dudley um, as the main event. I definitely remember that. Um, Tim Fisher actually then went on to be my first trainer in UPW uh, That's funny. about a year later. Yeah. Um, but the, the one thing that stands out to me was so there was uh, the four of us that went one. Uh, it was one of my buddy's girlfriends went to the women's restroom and uh you know we're enjoying the show everything's fun and stuff she comes back and she goes well there were about four porn chicks in there and they were doing coke right out in the open <laughs> oh <boy>. yeah <laughs> it was but you know it was such a it was such a unique experience and uh you know and Again, I think um, Dynamite D, you know, is one of those guys who just doesn't get enough, um, you know. Credit. Absolutely. Yeah, you know, he he did so much, uh, you know, for the business in Southern California, and you know, a lot of guys got into it. I know um, one of my good friends, Phil Lander, um, phenomenal mm -hmm. Phil, man. He 
you know, owes everything to Dynamite D. That was like one of his heroes. As, yeah, as do I. I mean, because if if D hadn't taken me under his wing, uh, you know, after or even kind of during the whole Slammers thing, um, I had no idea. I mean, there literally would not have been an XPW without D. I think that's where, especially because he left before the end of it. Um, right. You know, I think that people, that gets lost a lot um, and how integral he was to the start of it. Um, you know, uh, separate from the fact that he was a great character and performer for the company. Yeah. Um, but, you know, without him and Patrick, like, that that ignition uh, would never have happened to, to make it all come together. That's not to say that Rob wouldn't have found other people to work with and, and run a successful company or run a, you know, a similar company at all. You know, I mean, you know, I don't think Rob gets enough credit. A lot of times right. people, you know, look at everybody else that was involved there on the creative side or on the in-ring side or whatever. Rob doesn't get nearly enough credit for the fact that he really oversaw, um, you know, the, the general creative direction of, of the company. And, you know, we were all there producing these TV episodes all hours of all days and nights. Sure. 130 plus episodes. Um, so let me yeah, let me being, let me yeah. ask you about that with the the uh, the TV episode production. I know. I I mean again I I followed it because I was local and um, there was you know a lot of good stuff going on with the company and then the snag hit there where you had that run of shows <laughs> with no wrestling and just the promo spots. So creatively, who came up with the Pogo the Clown spots? Because <laughs> uh, I, <laughs> I mean, Pogo. Well, well, so first, let's take a step back, right? Yeah, I'm super proud of what we did for television. I honestly don't think that TV show gets enough credit because yeah. it, like, it, it's funny because people have been. I haven't brought it up, but other people have brought up that when you look at the Young Bucks. Um, being the elite show, yeah, and it became this big, huge, popular thing. Yep, that's essentially what XPW TV was. It yep. was it was sketch comedy and improv, and that's exactly what being the elite was. Um, yep. And I think it was just kind of like it was a little bit. Uh, there was always a stain on XPW because of the ECW wannabe copycat whatever vibe and right. the, just the war and the venom. Um, but when you look at that show, it was the first real kind of improv sketch comedy wrestling show that there was. And it had <clears throat> these full matches, but you saw what our actual kind of like abilities were when we went all those months with no wrestling. But right. we still made this entertaining TV show that people were watching because it had the skits and the vignettes and the 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 different packages um to answer your specific question i'm pretty sure that rob rob wrote and created everything pogo the clown related <laughs> um there were certain people that i wrote for certain people he wrote for um a lot uh certain people that could just do their own thing uh tim fisher yeah. uh is one uh johnny johnny webb was another yeah um, yeah and then and then there were certain um I mean, Rob always wrote the main event storyline and angles, but for everything else, um, usually, you know, he and I would talk ideas and then I would go and I'd write kind of the rest of the show. Um, and then we kind of just kind of go back and forth and, you know, fine tune and polish. And I was, I'm super big on, on continuity. Nowadays it's a thing like WWE is even hiring someone to like check up on their continuity of yeah. their writing. But if you go back and look at any of my products or anything I've been involved in from XPW to Wrestling Society X to Urban Wrestling Federation to whatever, you will see continuity through all of that. I'm right. such a stickler for that. Um, and so, you know, that, that's what I would do. You know, he'd come up with these ideas and be like, okay, well, but how do we link this to this? Or how do we, you know, make it make sense given we did this or we're trying to go here or whatever. So, um, uh, but yeah. That was uh, that was a very interesting period, and it was really it was such a different time because you know, we were syndicated nationally on this. Uh, I don't even remember America One, was yeah, the, name of the network. Yep. So we were on in the major markets for the most part. But if you had your rabbit ears in like all these random cities all across the country, <laughs> you could get XPW TV, and that's really what helped power uh, awareness and our our 
our VHS and DVD yep. sales. I and mean, we were the first independent company, even before ECW, to have home entertainment um, in stores. And we would, I'd see or hear from people all the time, or even these days when I'm traveling, you know, oh yeah, I used to, you know, watch XQW on America One and I'd, I'd get the videos at, you know, Suncoast or Sam Goody or wherever. And it's like, it's so amazing how far that show reached and how, I mean, that was really the only source of revenue for the company. Well, we were spending way too much money on the TV production right. and on the live events, um, but we were making tens of thousands of dollars on the home entertainment sales. And that's right. really, for, for that was really what kept the company going as long as it did. And, and it's interesting you say that because we just uh, recently talked to um, Douglas James. And um, he brought up the fact that uh, in Jersey, he stumbled across these videos of XPW. And it's just like, wow, man, you know, to think, Mm -hmm. you know, here was a kid who now is, you know, a phenomenal wrestler who just happened to go into, you know, a, uh, you know, Suncoast video store and see these tapes and go, Damn, well, I got to check this out, and was influenced by it. It's amazing. Um, so then let's uh, let's go to that night of uh, <laughs> of the ECW pay per view, and uh, I was in the arena that night, <laughs> and uh, I remember sitting there. I was on the main floor, and I was kind of center of the ring, and I looked over to my right. And all of a sudden, I see faces that I recognize, and I just went, "No fucking way!" And I'm just like, "This is not going to be good." <laughs> what actually happened, and what was the plan? And I, as I understand it, it wasn't like you know we were going to set out and cause a ruckus, but things nope. just unfolded, and it just went south from there what what is the yeah, actual I mean, story so, man? all right so so here's the thing right i maintain to this day that if paul Heyman had done this same thing at a wwe show legit he it would have been heralded as one of the greatest publicity stunts in the yeah. entire history of professional wrestling yeah but because it was xpw doing it it was just you know it was poor taste and it was this and it was that and it was whatever so that's that's my first statement on the matter um literally we had a show coming up at the la sports arena it was our one year anniversary show it was the biggest show we had ever done uh and we were like we need to get some publicity for this so uh unlike today where you it's super, super hard to get tickets because of online ticketing and this and that. Right. Uh, I knew all I had to do was camp out at the Ticketmaster outlet uh, <laughs> at the Tower Record on uh, Ventura Boulevard. Ventura. <laughs> camp out enough hours in advance, and I'd be able to buy tickets, hopefully, like right as soon as they went on sale. So that's what it is, and I bought the entire front row. Uh, and, and the entire like like front row of the balcony, too, just for other people like me. Um, and the plan literally was just to go and right before the main event, uh, oh, first of all, the plan was just to go in XPW shirts and just literally be sitting there right. and just get, get that, that recognition, you know? Uh, but when they got there and was told they had to turn their shirts around, no one could wear XPW shirts. Um, there's people in the back, like pointing out everyone in the crowd that was related or associated with XPW. Um, and so then the plan just became, all right. When the ring announcements are being made for the main event, or right in the main event, or something, uh, everyone will stand up, turn their shirts inside out, and put the XCW back on, and that was it. Like that was literally the plan. No one was going to jump the rail. No one was going to cause a ruckus, interfere in a match, throw anything at the ring. No one was going to do anything dumb or illegal. But uh, <laughs> basically, the, the the plan in the locker room ended up becoming okay. I guess uh, we're all going to get ready. And I don't know if their plan was to rush at a certain point or whatever, but when everybody stood up to to do their shirts or whatever, something happened with Francine yelling at the at, at the people, uh, and the whole locker room just cleared, and yeah. they just rushed on everybody. Um, and again, no one from XQW ever crossed the barricade or yeah. whatever, and they brawled literally like all the way through the crowd out the side. I had already left the building. 
Um, <laughs> I went out to do fire patrol. We were going to hit everyone with flyers. We were hit right. We were going to hit everyone as they walked out of the building. Right. And I'm standing there on the corner, and the door is flying open. And, like, this brawl erupts in the street. And I think one of the things that's still, like, super misunderstood to this day is that, like, none of the actual XCW wrestlers got beat up. Right. Like, there was flyer crew and ring crew, guys and girls, who ended up getting shoved and pushed and, and punched. But, like, I don't think there was one. I do think Messiah got slapped. But <laughs> that was that was about it. Uh, and, it yeah, it was, and it, you know, it became... I think it's still, WWE has it on their website as, like, I don't know, one of the wildest things ever or one of the craziest yeah. moments in wrestling or I don't know. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, that was that was it. But um, it, it, is, it is remembered uh, how it is remembered, and uh, I still think it was pretty good publicity stunt. Oh, yeah. There's, there's no doubt because, you know um... – it's still talked about and and i think what's even better is that it's so urban legend now because there's so many different accounts of what actually happened and it's become yeah. this wonderful story that there's really you know the truth and then there's this this wonderful fantasy of there's you know accounts that like you said, like XPW wrestlers got the shit knocked out of them that, you know, um, that it wasn't like an escort out. It was more so that they went out of the stadium and then went to the parking lot to wait for ECW. (laughs) There's all these different stories. And the funniest thing too, is that door that goes out onto the street. Then like, if you literally walk across the street, you're going into, the uh, tent like facilities for we're homeless we're t- tenting out oh yeah <laughs> you know yeah. so it was just like it was i don't think there's been anything better in terms of an la story than that because that whole thing just was just a beautiful example of what you know what happens in <laughs> in la in real life and that is anything <laughs> It was just wonderful yeah. to see. Um, and let's, you know, XPW did close down eventually. But um, one of the things I wanted to talk to you about was how did it come about to do the um, Cold Day in Hell, the reunion of XPW? Uh, so XPW got purchased. So XPW stopped. XPW got purchased by uh, Extreme Entertainment Group, XCG, who had been distributing the home videos. Right. So uh, they're distributing the home videos. They buy it. Uh, then Extreme Entertainment Group split basically into two companies, Extreme Entertainment Group and Big Vision Entertainment. Um, eventually, after the end of XCW, I go to work for Big Vision Entertainment. No plans on doing anything with wrestling or doing anything with new wrestling production. And that doesn't last very long. And soon we're the largest special interest home video distributor in the world, distributing more you know, uh, wrestling videos than anyone except for WWE. You went to the Best Buy or any of those stores, and, like, on the special interest shelf, it was WWE and Big Vision. We were putting out XPW stuff. We were putting out um, WWN stuff and Glow and uh, all sorts of documentaries and, and just a whole bunch of stuff. And so because we had this outlet and because DVDs were still selling at the time, the whole idea was just to do a production for straight to DVD. Uh, and so Big Vision and XCG backed it, funded it, and um, that was Cold Day in Hell. Gotcha. And, you know, one of the constants that, and in, in you brought up the uh, the media group and stuff, one of the constants, and I, I want to get your your take on him, um, is uh, Chris Cla- uh, Kloss. What, what is it like working with Kloss? Because... <laughs> yeah exactly I mean, like i don't think there's a person out there that i've run into who has like a bad thing to say about Klaus. he's just such a cool no, dude. chris is chris is great so chris when i started going to slam like the very first couple times i went to slammers chris was that one jerk off fan in the crowd that just, like, <laughs> was, a, was a was a loud mouth to everybody uh but he was you know he was funny um and then uh Eventually, we met up again during SCCW, um, and 
yeah, brought him into XPW. Chris is great in terms of getting people who are not hardcore wrestling fans excited about what they're watching. Yeah. Um, he just that energy that he has. Like, a lot of wrestling fans knock him for being too over the top or too excitable. Um, but that's that's how he is. And, <laughs> that's yeah, his, and, and not yeah. exactly. And not not just not just um, non wrestling fans in terms of him being engaging for them, but producers, television networks, like people who don't follow wrestling but want to have exciting wrestling, see his commentary and they're like, "We need this guy. This guy. This guy has the energy that we want." Um, so Chris has been great, uh, you know, throughout the years on uh, you know a number of projects um, from. Uh, XPW, Wrestling Society X, and, and uh, uh, I think he did some, uh, at least one or two uh, pay-per-view things with Master Public. Um, so, yeah, this is great. And you, you did bring up uh, WSX. Um, how was it working with MTV? Did they have a lot of say or... Were you guys fairly in control? Because I know, oh, n- n- uh, no, <laughs> uh, no. I mean, uh, look, I would go back and do it all over again. Best year of my life, professionally, financially. Uh, you know, I had a dream of creating a wrestling company and an idea for what to do. And MTV put three and a half million dollars behind doing it, uh, but that gave them the ability to have their stamp on it and yeah. so it became a much different product than i would have necessarily done on my own it's funny because if anyone has the actual like dvd set um and you go back and you watch the ws extra episodes where the wrestling is cut like a wrestling show and not like an mtv show <laughs> uh it's a it's a much different and better product yeah. um but look you can only do so much in 23 minutes and I, you know, it was still, it's a show that is fondly remembered both as just a huge what the fuck uh, and also <laughs> breaking so many talents to the national and international stage that people didn't know of before. Even if they had been you know, known by the, the, the hardcore wrestling fans, you know, from Jack Evans and, and Teddy Hart, because, you know, they had been known in Ring of Honor, right. but they weren't known necessarily to the casual fan in France or Japan or Mexico who got to see the TV show. Uh, you know, obviously Seth Rollins probably the biggest yeah. um, of the names who come from the show, but Colt Cabana, uh, Matt you know, Seidel, uh, Matt Seidel, yep. yeah. So you know, for me, one of one of my most proudest legacies from the show was just really having an eye for and being able to bring exposure to young talents, and that's something that we continue to do these days. Like even if you look ahead at our at our Expo Lucha event, um, there's a lot of young talent on that show that have been selected to be on that show because I'm very confident they are going to be the next kind of generation of stars. I mean, even going back to, you mentioned before Douglas James, yeah. we've got a, we've got a six man match coming up at Expo Lucha where it's well-known luchadors who are hot luchadors, Puma King, Laredo yep. kid and Flamita going again, Douglas James, Jake Atlas and uh, Adrian quest. Yep. And I'm telling you, those three guys who actually have started now to work for the uh, AAA uh, EMW affiliate in Tijuana, but those are guys that I've been pushing to Conan or, or, or recommending to people now for anywhere from two years to you know the last year or so, um, and you know so so that's continued to kind of be a part at least for me um, of what I enjoy about being able to produce wrestling is identifying and and kind of honing uh you know some of the some of the talent that i think can be the next big things you know one interesting question that i've always had about that time frame of uh wsx i know i remember that there was just this rumor that was mtv pushing you guys to get someone like a hogan in Mm, i don't remember no i don't think so okay um and they certainly didn't have i mean as much as our budget was large uh they, they didn't have Hogan money kind of in yeah. the yeah, yeah it wasn't in the card um i think i mean who the whole thing's just so strange because you know 
the business was just very different back then. The business television was very different back then. Right. You know, what I pitched MTV on doing was really kind of what they ended up doing with Bellator, which was, just don't think about this just as a TV show. You guys own this. You know, you are partners in this. So let's look at touring. Let's look at pay-per-view. Let's look at merchandising. And the way that the television business is set up really is that, you know, we were only working with the TV executives. And so their only concern, their only job is TV ratings. And so none of that other stuff really mattered to them. And there was a lot of, um, uh, a lot of change over to MTV at the time, and and I, I really think that two things happened that kind of killed the show right away. One one was, I mean, the TV business in general does not reward risk. Yeah, um, it's much easier to just keep doing the same types of shows over and over and over because yeah. if you don't put your neck out for something, then you, there's no chance of really failing. Um, and that's not a knock on any of the executives we worked with. I love all the executives that we worked with um, directly on the show. But I think, you know, above them, basically, people were going to have to decide either to put their neck on the line for a wrestling show or not put their neck on the line for a wrestling show. And I think in the end, it was just determined that, you know, no one wanted to put their neck on the line for a wrestling show, as opposed to what you see going on right now with, like, All Elite and TNT. I mean, TNT, the show is not even on air yet. Right. And TNT as a network has given AEW more promotion than Wrestling Society X got the entire time that it was coming soon and on air yeah i mean that says a lot you know so again the business has really changed um and i think that hopefully that bellator model of kind of owning a piece of something and 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 being able to um exploit it and understand what you have in a property will hopefully uh you know be seen in other other areas as well and, and maybe even in pro wrestling someday down the road um <clears throat> The um, I'm gonna move to uh, Lucha Las Vegas. Who created it? Which, which one was that? Lucha Las Vegas. Lucha Las Vegas. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, uh, long story short, after Wrestling Society X, um, I thought again. All right, I'm done with wrestling, uh, <laughs> and then that didn't last very long. Uh, so quickly, it became all right, well, what's next? And, and for me, I never, nothing I've ever done has ever been, let's just start a wrestling company and try to compete with WWE or be the same thing with WWE. Because there's so many people that do that. Right. Especially right now, there's so many people that do it and do it well. Uh, so I've always looked for like, what what is the niche that isn't being filled? Uh, you know, even with XPW, it was hardcore on the West Coast. With Wrestling Society X, it was um, basically merging rock and wrestling on a grander scale than it had ever been done before. Right. And giving it this kind of whole punk rock vibe. Um, with, and then after that, it became, I saw Lucha Libre as the one really kind of untapped genre where it still had potential to get bigger on a global scale. Um, because women's wrestling can get bigger and hardcore wrestling can get bigger and this and that, but I never really saw them as truly kind of global opportunity or having the fan base to go beyond being niche. Right. Um, and so, you know, obviously Lucha had been part of XPW, Lucha had been part of, you know, Wrestling Society X, been part of everything. Um, but that's where I wanted to put all my focus. And so um, around 2010, I started working with, uh, well, back right after Wrestling Society X, we did a, a pilot called uh, Viva La Lucha, the G4 network. Um, and that's really when I started working closely with Ruben Zamora, who had a company called Mass Republic. Um, and then around 2010, when I left Big Vision, that became my kind of full-time focus in pro wrestling, and he and I became partners in Mass Republic. Uh, yeah. And so Lucha Las Vegas was our concept. Um, you know, uh, it was partially, again, kind of mixing that music and wrestling connection like Wrestling Society X, but I always thought that Lucha Libre as a Las Vegas attraction could work well. Um, because you can not only build a local following of people that came out every week or every month or whatever, but it can be a really fun touristy thing. Because Lucha Libre and going to the Lucha show is much different to a lot of people's mindsets than going to a wrestling show. Right. People would never go to a WWE event. People would never buy a John Cena t-shirt. Would go to Lucha Libre because it's kind of a cultural experience. Right. Um, and they'd wear a mask of, even if they didn't know who Demon or Sanso or someone was, they would buy and wear that mask on their shirt because it's kind of cool. <laughs> um, and so that was the idea with Lucha Las Vegas was let's create a, a Las Vegas show and let's see what we can do. Um, 
it, uh, I mean, putting on a Las Vegas show in a hotel is a very, very expensive venture. Yeah. Um, that's why a lot of people don't do it. But um, I thought the pilot was really, uh, or we, we, we cut a sizzle reel from the pilot, uh, actually signed a deal with Bischoff Hervey Entertainment. Um, they were going to take and try to sell the show um, and develop it for television. Um, unfortunately, that was kind of right around the same time that they signed on to take over uh, Impact Wrestling. TNA, yeah. And so it was just kind of on the on the back burner for about six months with them. And then we kind of came to a mutual parting of the ways where I took the property back. And, uh, you know, we all went our separate ways. Still super cool with everybody there. And uh, I really had a great time. I, I worked for them um, as a producer on the Hulk Hogan Micro Championship Wrestling Show. Yeah. Um, and so that was a great experience. I learned a ton about making reality television. Um, and, and it was, uh, it was a really good experience. Um, but so that was Lucha Las Vegas. We still have that. I still think we can do something with it at some point. Um, I have a couple different versions of it. Um, because for me, it wasn't always necessarily just going to be about basically doing a wrestling show in Vegas. Um, I think that there's a fun quasi docu reality version of like putting that show on, uh, and the behind the scenes of putting on a Las Vegas show that involves wrestlers and showgirls and minis and, and bands and all that. Um, or even a mockumentary version of it where you kind of take the scrubs or, you know, Muppet show type approach, um, and, or the office, I guess is a good way to look at it too. Um, so it, it's still a property that's in play and hopefully someday we'll, something will happen with that. Well, you're you're talking to the right guys who uh, definitely would try to make that happen because uh, if you're looking at Las Vegas and you're looking Lucha and you're looking guys who <laughs> know production and uh, wouldn't mind uh, dabbling in that, especially with uh, comedy background, uh, that I like the uh, yeah. I like the mockumentary. Right, That's well, interesting. Uh, well, let's, uh, let's well, put a pin in that one. And, yeah, uh, we'll, we'll offline we'll offline about that. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> D DJ, uh, remember to cut that portion out so no one hears that. So that uh... <laughs> right, gotcha. <laughs> uh, so from that, um, you know, you, you were with Mass Republic. You, you started that up, or you know, became partners on that. Um, where did the concept of uh, Expo Lucha come from? And um, the one that's coming up is that, if I'm not mistaken, is that the second one? Yeah, because yeah. so, you did one last uh, year in Vegas, right? Correct, we did. Yeah. Um, so there, there's an event called Lucha Libre La Experiencia, which is essentially the Lucha Expo of Mexico um, that was running for a number of years in Mexico City. And it was this convention, this huge convention, where literally every major promotion, including AAA and CMLL. So now imagine wow. that, wow. you know, either today or even just like, uh, you know, compare it to WWE and WCW, you know, running in the same building, would do events over the weekend, tons of meet and greet, tons of different activities, a lot of independence. Um, and it was a huge two day thing. And, uh, Ruben and I went a number of years working with the Pedro Del Mall group, um, either bringing them talent for their shows or one year we filmed it for, uh, one of our Viva La Lucha pay per views. And, Ruben always said, we really got to do this in the United States. We have to figure out a way to, to make an Expo Lucha type thing happen in the United States. Um, and so for years, it was just kind of an idea. And eventually he was like, we really, really need to do this. And I said, cool. Uh, if you want to head it up <laughs> and make it happen, let's do it. Um, cause I, you know, uh, a lot. I I run most of our like the business side of our licensing, and he runs all of the um, like luchador relationships with the licensing. Okay. Um, and then I do a lot of our our television development, film development, um, comic book development. Um, and so Expo Lucha is his his kind of side of of the equation. Um, and so yeah, we put it together and uh, we did the first one in Las Vegas, kind of as our proof of concept last year. Um, I think that for people who came uh, and experienced it, especially having been our first time running a convention, it went really well. Yeah. Um, our pro our problem really was just you know the attendance wasn't quite what we had hoped for. Um, I think that part of it had to do with um, the market. Part of it had to do with we ended up running up against All In, right. which um, had not been announced at the time that we announced the year prior. Um, there's a bunch of different little things that contributed to the attendance itself not being as huge, but as a proof of concept, it was, it was really good. 
Um, and we knew that, that we could recreate this and kind of make some tweaks and, and do it again. So uh, this year it is in San Diego, August 16th, uh, sorry, August 17th and 18th, um, two days, four live events. Uh, we're doing a, we do one event called Viva La Lucha, which is our, our general brand, but it's where a number of independent groups each bring a match that they want to highlight. Um, you get to see a good variety of talent from a number of different promotions. Then we have our one night only Lucha Society X Super Show, uh, which is basically taking wrestlers that were on Wrestling Society X, wrestlers that were on Lucha Underground, and wrestlers that f- would have fit well in either one of those, and doing a uh, big indie super show on, on Saturday night. Uh, Sunday midday, we have the Legends of Lucha Libre show, where you've got guys like Dr. Wagner, Octagon, Fuerza Guerrera, Pirata Morgan, Damian 666. Uh, and then on Sunday night, we have our big Mexico versus the World Super Show, which is basically, as it sounds like, Mexico uh, luchadors versus wrestlers from all over the place. Um, the main event is Penta and Phoenix and Mr. Aguila, who will be reunited with Lita for the first time in <laughs> almost 20 years. Uh taking on Brian Cage, TJP, and Jack Evans. Uh, the semi-main wow. event is Psychosis, Juventud Guerrera, and uh, Black Tortoise, taking on the MLW's Hart Foundation, Teddy Hart, David Boy Smith Jr., Brian Tillman Jr. We've got the match that I talked about earlier, uh, Laredo Kid, Puma King, and uh, Flamita versus Jake Atlas, and Douglas James, and Ethan Quest, um, and a, a number of other matches. Uh, so a really big convention and the thing that separates our convention from most of the other conventions and, uh, what separates Expo Lucha from all wrestling conventions really is that when you buy your one day or two day pass, it includes autographs and photos with almost all the talent on the show. So literally you buy two day pass for, I think it's like 175 gets you all the extra swag too, or 125, 125, you're in for both days, all four shows t-shirt, posters, lapel pin, all the sorts of merchandise, and that includes autographs and photos with um, most everybody. And, you know, you go to a regular wrestling convention, you're paying to get in the door, and then you're paying 20 to $40 for an autograph and yep. photo easily. Uh, and here you're getting, you know, like $1,000 worth of autographs and photos uh, included. So we try to keep it super family-friendly. Um, we keep the wrestling family-friendly. And, uh, you know, it's just a really cool experience. We have art exhibits and, and Lucha Mask exhibits. And um, we use it for a lot of our licensing announcements. So we've got a whole slew of products that people are going to get to see or hear about for the first time. Um, we've got this year, we've got the Jack Evans Video Game Challenge. Uh, Jack <laughs> Evans not only known for being a great, uh, you know, non-Mexican luchador, but also really great at crash talking his video game skills uh, on social media. <laughs> Uh, and so we are making Jack put his uh, his money where his mouth is, so to speak. And uh, both attendees and other wrestlers are going to be able to step up and challenge Jack in video games. And there are going to be some very awesome prizes that I will be able to reveal shortly. Um, but they are within the video game space. Um, so, yeah, it's, uh, it's a really cool time. Uh, Expolucha.com has all the information, tickets. Uh, you can buy the one-day pass if you don't want to go both days or if you don't care about autographs and photos and you just want to come for the nighttime uh super shows tickets are only 25 bucks for the show uh for general mission and ten dollars for kids so uh, definitely if you're anywhere in, in california arizona nevada las vegas uh <laughs> Yo, definitely baby. come on come on down and uh check out the largest lucha libre convention in history uh this uh this coming August in San Diego. You know, um, you said family friendly, and uh, let me just uh, you know ask you. I know through uh, Facebook, I see every once in a while some just unbelievably wonderful posts um, regarding your kids, and I know that your kids uh, do have uh, you know special needs, um, and I know you're big into um, organizations that you know help kids with special needs. Um, just tell me a little bit about how it is, you know, having these, you know, just wonderful moments. I know when you post something, it always just, you just see the love of, you know, the kids have for you. And it's just amazing, man. Oh, I don't even know where to start on that one. Um, yes. Yeah, so 
my children uh, both have a really rare genetic disorder called Angelman syndrome. Um, it is not very well known and was even less well known when um, I, when they were diagnosed. Uh, literally, my son was diagnosed. Um, we filmed the Wrestling Society X pilot in 2006. So 2000 and... Uh, 2000, February of 2006. So my son was diagnosed in December of 2005. And then my daughter was diagnosed literally the day before we shot the pilot for Wrestling Society X. Uh, wow. And um, so it's a really rare genetic disorder. A um, bunch of the common kind of elements of it are a lack of speech, um, seizure disorders, um, general kind of global mental and physical delays. Um, my son is 16. My daughter is thir- Well, daughter just turned 14. Um, and they'll both be mentally three, four years old forever. Yeah. Um, so it's a, it's a big, it's a big thing. Um, and, but, um, you know, through that, uh, they still can accomplish so much. Um, they both use a communication device, use an iPad with speech software on there so they can push pictures and icons and they'll speak for them. Um, they are, they attend normal schools, uh, in a special day class. Um, uh, and we, we are involved, um, with a, a, uh, charity called the foundation for Angelman therapeutics, which is working to find a cure. Um, Amazingly, they've already found uh, what seems to be a cure or part of a cure in lab mice. Wow. Um, and now they're trying to find the funding to basically now take that and change it um, and make it be workable in humans. But um, I think one of the hard things with like extremely rare genetic disorders or rare disorders of any kind is, you know, they don't have the awareness of the funding that, you know, the American Cancer Society has or, right. you know, things that affect more people. And that's not to say that that shouldn't be. Um, you know, the more, the more something affects someone, certainly the more money should have. But so FAST, um, the foundation, um, collects money that all 100% goes to research for Angelman syndrome and for finding that cure. Because, you know, a lot of times you hear about these big charities and, you know, most of the money is going to their executives and to running it and not to the actual research. And so we've, we've really become very fond of that because a hundred percent of the money goes to the research. It was started by parents of, of children with Angelman syndrome and it's, the board is uh, a lot of people that are involved. Um, so yeah, I, um, to me, it's also really important spreading the word because even when the kids got diagnosed, um, doctors a lot of doctors still didn't recognize the kind of easier telltale signs of of having angelman syndrome um and a lot of kids my son included get misdiagnosed at first um Uh oh you know they have cerebral palsy or oh they have some kind of disorder that we're never gonna know um and that's kind of where we were at that at the point we just kind of kept pushing and pushing and uh, but there are certain things that one of the doctors said to us about the spacing between their teeth and about their, their laugh and their smile, um, about the, the, their, what's called the gait of how they, how they walk, um, the kind of the spacing between their legs and, and right. how they, how they were walking at the time. And those are super telltale signs. And, and once Angelman syndrome got mentioned to me and, and my ex-wife, we went home, we Googled it and it was like, you know, the heavens opened and a light shined down and we were like, oh my God, this is exactly our, our child, our son at the time. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's super, super big and important to me. Um, I mean, honestly, you know, I don't hide it outside of, of Master Public. I have a corporate job. You guys mentioned it at the top. I work for an entertainment company called Viz Media, um, and it's a great job where I work in the anime space and um, work in, in the uh, kind of uh, distribution uh, of the content on the digital side. Uh, but Master Public for me is both my passion in terms of the wrestling business um, and also for me, my kid's future yeah. uh, because they're never going to be able to take care of themselves. You know, you, you think when you have a child, okay, well, you know, they're going to turn 18 eventually and they're going to or 20 and they're going to go off to college and they're going to, you know, or whatever, they're going to be able to take care of themselves. Um, and my kids won't. So like my biggest fear in life is, you know, making sure that they don't end up in some minimum care state run 
you know, institution right. um, when I'm gone. Uh, and so, you know, that's part of what drives me every day with Mass Republic and, and, you know, makes me have these crazy, you know, go to a corporate job and come home and, and uh, do this or what makes us go through putting on the Expo Luchas and the, and the other things that, right. that uh, take an immense amount of time. But, um, you know, we're, we're here building not only our, our kind of dream business for ourselves, but, um, you know, I'm looking as a how I'm going to uh, you know, take care of these kids uh, as long as they live because they their life expectancy is still typical human being life expectancy. So right. um, they will be here for a lot longer, hopefully, and uh, that's expensive. Yeah. <laughs> Well, Special needs are not. Kids are expensive. Ex- yeah, exactly. <laughs> Tell me about it. And you know, um, you know, if anyone is listening, please um, check out, um, you know, check out the organization. See if there's anything you can do to help. Um, you know, small donation or something because uh, it's definitely an important thing. Um, and like you said, you know, all these bigger foundations, you know, get all these donations, which definitely is something that is needed but also you know rarer diseases are something that um you know we need to find you know cures or at least something that will you know help and normalize um their lives so that you know maybe it it won't be burdensome you know in the future you won't have to worry uh, as much yeah um, absolutely now one of the great things though is you know you mentioned your ex-wife but your current wife, um, I know that's the other thing you, you when you post things, uh, you know, online that um, definitely shows that, you know, there's a silver lining out there in your life because your kids and your wife um, are definitely, you know, what keeps driving you. Um, how did you oh. how did you meet her? <laughs> uh, well, first I would say, yes, no, I mean, there's no way. Uh, I would be able to do any of the stuff that I do, uh, both in terms of raising these children and, uh, you know, my career and, and master public without, uh, my insanely amazing wife. Um, and she being a stepmom, uh, you know, she didn't have to, I, I, I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to cry on the podcast, uh, <laughs> but she, uh, I mean, she stepped into this super complicated world of, uh, you know, not only having to navigate somebody with an X period, uh, but, you know, these these two kids who need a lot more attention and a lot yeah. more love. And she, I mean, she literally, in a positive manner, I mean, runs our lives. Uh, the, the progress that these kids have made in terms of their communication, in terms of their walking, in terms of just their health in general um she is the one that's behind all of that and i i i thank her every single day um like literally uh tell her how much i appreciate her every single day because it's absolutely the case um uh how we met though is kind of funny uh so real quick uh big vision the dvd company that we were talking about um eventually the dvd business started to find its way into dumps stores went bankrupt so distributors went bankrupt so labels went near bankrupt um and literally even though big vision technically never declared bankruptcy uh when employees don't get paid for months and months and months (laughs) and there's no money it's basically the same thing so big vision collapsed as i say uh i lost everything um i lost my house i lost my cars i lost absolutely everything had no money moved to Arizona for a year, uh, trying to get out of LA and the expenses of LA could not find good work in Arizona. Um, and my ex at the time had become, uh, friends with, uh, a couple other parents and kids with the same disorder in a city called Castro Valley that I had never even heard of. Uh, but I didn't know where the Bay area was. Uh, and so we said, screw it. Let's move. We were still, we were, it was super complicated. We were divorced, but so living together in the same house because of the kids. Um, and so moved to Castro Valley. Uh, once we got here, I needed a job right away. Um, still trying to find my way back into the corporate world. And I went and I got a job at the Starbucks that was on the corner near my apartment and uh, worked at Starbucks for a whopping 
three months, I think. Um, uh, when I was in Arizona, the only real work that I was able to get was that pilot for the Hulk Hogan's Micro Championship Wrestling TV show. Yeah. Uh, working at Starbucks for about three months, get a call. Hey, show got picked up for series. Do you want to uh, come and be a producer on the series? Well, I had no money. I was working at Starbucks. They were offering me $2,000 a week to come on the road to produce the television show, and I quit Starbucks. Um, and my wife, uh, she worked at Starbucks as well. We never really worked together, and I never really talked to her, but I had to find someone to cover my shift when I was quitting. So, <laughs> long story short, uh, we ended up texting because of that, and now uh, nine or so years later, we have not stopped texting. <laughs> and got married, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> well, uh, she's, uh, dare I say, she's a gorgeous woman, and it's amazing that um, she's one of those that you look and you go, how the hell did he get her? So you got that going for I you, which is great. I will accept that. I will absolutely accept that <laughs> yeah. and agree with that. Um, and really quick, uh, as I'm starting to wrap down here, um, the, the wedding itself, um, you had it officiated by one of the greatest guys out there in the whole world, Ryan Katz. I mean, come on. <laughs> uh, you, you got Katz ordained to do this, and now it's like his thing. Um, you know how, That I did. How, how long have you known Ryan? Does it go all the way back to uh, XPW? Yeah. So um, I met Ryan when he basically applied, I guess, to come work for XPW because he was trying to move, um, wanted to move from Colorado to LA. Yeah. Uh, so he, um, he came to XPW not only as a performer, but he was in the office with us. He was, you know, one of the main creative people driving the, the ship and working on television every week. Um, and he just, he became one of my best friends, uh, you know, uh, in and out of the wrestling business. I'm Jewish. My wife is Christian. Um, we did not want to have a religious <laughs> wedding one way or the other. And uh, it was actually, she was the one, I'm pretty sure, that came up with the idea of having him do it and asking <laughs> him uh, if he would do it. Uh, which I was like, this is such a great idea. Uh, and so, yeah, that, that was that. We got him, we got him ordained, and uh, he performed the ceremony, and uh, we made sure that all the all the. I've got it and T's are crossed and we are legitimately <laughs> married uh, by the uh, by Ryan Katz and, and approved in the eyes of the federal government. <laughs> nice. And uh, uh, we're going to do a really quick word association in one second before we finish off. Um, one question, though, coming from uh, Raven is, was his wedding invite really lost in the mail? <laughs> oh, Lord. <laughs> Remember what I told you at the beginning, which might have been before we were on air, about what my <laughs> wife asked when I when I mentioned yeah. that I, you, I knew, mm -hmm. I'm just gonna leave it at that. There you go. <laughs> Boom. Uh, that's code Raven. When you listen to the episode, you can ask us later. <laughs> right. All right. Really quick, we're gonna do a quick word association here. Um, I'm just gonna name some uh, different names here. Um, just give me the first thing that comes to your mind with uh, these fellows here, and we did talk about some of them, but again, just one word association or the first thing that comes to your mind. First person, Conan. Oh, man, this is a lot of pressure. Yeah, Conan. Uh, uh, underappreciated. Ruben Torres. Really good human being. I know that's more than one word. That's okay. <laughs> that's all right. Uh, Chris Kloss. <laughs> I can't do the scream, but that scream is the one <laughs> thing that comes to mind. Like the first thing that comes to mind is ah! <laughs> uh, Joey Chaos. Uh, really proud of everything that he has he has created. Excellent. Uh, Rob, I am. I am really proud. Not saying he is on right. YouTube. I'm. Saying, I'm really proud. Rob Black. Uh, doesn't get enough credit. For what he did, not going to get into the whys or hows or whether people think you know later things disavowed earlier things, but doesn't get enough credit for actually what he did at the time. Uh, Ryan Katz, super creative. Angel, 
Man, I wish he was still doing more uh, uh, of what he did because uh, people loved that guy and that gimmick uh, yeah. and another former Slammers alumni. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Trina Michaels. Uh, <laughs> uh, I would say uh, never got to live up to full potential in the business. Luke Hawks. Um, so I got to go two parter here. One person my wife most loves to hate, uh, <laughs> and 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 two uh, somebody that has been one of the most real uh, and there for me people uh, ever, and I will always appreciate his friendship. Excellent. Ray Mysterio. Most iconic luchador on the planet. Willie Mac. Oh, man. Well, this is, okay, real quick, short story. Yeah. Uh, Willie is my shining example of never judge a book by its cover. I try <laughs> to be someone who, who you know, I'm really, I, mean, I, I definitely believe in, you know, don't judge a book by its cover, but... I always use that because when Willie would take three, four, seven, whatever buses it was to come to XPW shows as a kid and be like, I'm going to be a pro wrestler one day. Like, sure, kid, you know, go for it. Uh, And he has turned into both a really, really good person and uh, an incredible wrestler who definitely defied a lot of odds to, uh, you know, become that. And uh, I'm, I'm so proud every time I see him. Teddy Hart. Who was that? Teddy Hart? Teddy Hart. Oh, uh, there is only one Teddy Hart. Um, <laughs> and, you know, some people say, thank God. Some people say, you know, I wish we could clone him. But uh, <laughs> I'm just going to leave it at that. There's only one Teddy Hart. Shane Douglas. The franchise. What else can you say? <laughs> and finally, Dave Marquez. Uh, Dave Marquez, another one of, uh, I'd say, uh, the most real and, and has consistently been there for me, people in the business. Uh, I think Dave, another one of those guys that doesn't get enough credit for what he's been able to accomplish and, uh, and do. Um, he had a vision of how to produce and present pro wrestling, uh, on a, a regional yet national scale that he's been trying to do for a long time. And, He's actually doing it now, and in an incredible fashion. Uh, he has his niche, and he is uh, really finding success, starting to branch it out into these other territories now, and I'm really happy for him. Excellent. Man, Kevin, you had uh, you said it all, man. You have said <laughs> it good. all. <laughs> <laughs> and we appreciate you, man, with, uh, for coming on with us tonight. Um, Normally, we take this opportunity to ask, what do you want to promote? And I know you've promoted several times the Lucha Libre Convention. You could do that again. But if you want to throw out there your uh, retail company, your magazine, your clothing brand, you could do that as well, man. What would you like people to Honestly, check out? I, I would I would just say okay. follow Mass Republic, M-A-S-K-E-D, Republic, on all social media. Okay. Uh, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. Uh, follow Legends of Lucha Libre okay. on Instagram and on Facebook, Legends of Lucha on Twitter. Uh, and uh, Expo Lucha is, is uh, expolucha.com for all the information. Um, but yeah, man, uh, I appreciate the time. No doubt. All of you guys, um, definitely check out uh, all the cool officially licensed products that we put out of, uh, of luchadors and uh and uh, other wrestlers and uh yeah hopefully you'll see you guys and more uh at expo lucha absolutely everyone kevin this is when the audience get to stand up and do their cheer <laughs> kevin <Clyra. laughs> awesome thank you hey we'll be right back in a moment Hey, what's up, everybody? This is your boy, Simon Street, with the Vegas Bad Boys of Podcasting. Want to let everybody know that on Thursday, September 5th through Friday, September 6th, at Sam's Town Hotel Gambling Casino, Impact Live Wrestling 
is going to be here in Vegas. Again, that's going to be on September 5th and September 6th at Sam's Town Live. We're going to be there. Hope to see you there, too. This is Iron Heart, Douglas James. I am a Santino Bros Wrestling alumni. And on August 17th, we are putting on Put Up or Shut Up. And every time I go out there, I show out, show up, and I put up or shut up. So check out the show on August 17th in Southgate, California. Well, hey, everybody. This is Darwin Finch just reminding you here to catch Wrestling Pro Wrestling at the Burbank Moose Lodge every third Friday of every month. August 17th, Survival of the Fittest. FSW brings you Graves and Project Body Count. Oh, the numbers get bigger every fucking show. Who's going to get their fucking asses beat this next show? Survival of the Fittest. There ain't nobody fucking fit enough in FSW. Body Count is coming. Graves is coming. Survival of the Fittest. Now back to Vegas, bad boys of podcasting. Okay, we're back. And we're just going to talk just a little bit about SummerSlam that's coming up. First off, Simon, you and I will be out there this weekend. Yeah. Into Toronto. So I'm just curious, is there any matches, guys, that you're interested in seeing this weekend? Just a match that you're pumped up and seeing taking place in Toronto. Any particular match. I'm I'm excited to see uh Drake versus anybody. Drake versus anybody? I miss him. <laughs> <laughs> Well, he might be at the show. You never know. I mean, I've never known him being a wrestling fan, but it is big, so he may be there. But uh, a real match. Are there, are there cameras at the event? <laughs> yes. Yeah, he'll be there. <laughs> and it's the home of the uh, NBA champions, correct? Yes, it is. Yeah, uh, yeah I know. Well, it happens to be. Uh, is there any matches? Anything? Uh, I I personally am looking forward to AJ Styles versus Ricochet. Okay. Yeah. Um, It's... It, it, it's really invigorating seeing AJ Styles as a heel and just recognizing how good of a talent he is when he plays that role. And when you have Gallows and Anderson with him, it just, it's the icing on the cake. So, and you've got Ricochet who ultimately will be built up, I hope, as a result of this. Whether or not he reclaims the championship, that's neither here nor there. Um, he will be elevated as a result of this match, or at least I damn sure hope. Yeah. Gotcha. And just a quick question, being that you mentioned um, AJ, what's your take on this whole the OC? Do you like the name or uh, I mean, is it, it cool? It is what it is. It's it's marketing. Okay. Um, it's WWE marketing at its finest. Um, I see what they're trying to do. Um, obviously, you know, targeting the Bullet Club and saying that they're the only club that matters. In the OC. Yeah. The yeah. OC. The OC. <laughs> the OC. The OC. Other than, cool. the, other than the mere fact that it's a walking meme, um, yeah. I mean, you know, they, the name that they've branded him as, it doesn't mean a damn thing to me. Um, just seeing them together, I mean, you can tell how happy uh, all three of those guys mm-hmm. are that they're that they're working together and on the same side. So that that comes through in their work for sure. Got you, Simon. Well. My apologies ahead of time, sir. Okay. There are a couple of matches that I'm very looking forward to with watching for SummerSlam. The first match is... Actually, the first match I would say I'm really excited for just because I think they've done a great job. Um, Even though it's harking back to Stone Cold, Steve Austin, and Vince McMahon type of thing. But that's the, you know, Kevin Owens and Shane McMahon. Feud. I'm actually quite pleased with how it's going. It's it's not a total. I don't. In my opinion. I don't think it's a total ripoff. Okay. But I think it, the way it's building for me it is satisfying, and I would love to see uh, maybe a conclusion. I don't know if it'll be a conclusion, but I'd like to see what the next step is. The best in the world. Huh? Yeah. I don't know. Um, Tell us, Ko. <laughs> <laughs> but um, mine is. I'll be honest with you. Before there was ever. 
uh, a twinkle in my eye for uh, you know Sasha Banks. There was one woman that took the spot, Bailey, okay. and no, um, <laughs> but nothing towards Bailey. Um, but there was another woman that uh, really helped me through my puberty, as it did most oh. men in my age category. Okay, and Sherry I'm Martel. always no Bull Nakano. <laughs> no, a Lunder Blaze. No. Maybe with a couple Coronas. Oops. Maybe. Um, Fabulous Miller. One time, there was that really bad case of weed I smoked. I was going <laughs> to let you know. Yeah. Fuck. May Young? Hells no. Hold on. She What's... showed her tits on, on pay-per-view. Yeah. Problem is, I didn't look down further enough to her waistline. Mm. So, <laughs> <there's that. laughs> So this case of weed you smoked, how big is a case of weed? <laughs> how big enough? How, yeah, exactly. How how big is a case of weed and where can not we obtain the, Not the physical substance. term of get, fucking give, weed. Give me the name. Not Simon. the case. Anyways, you're, you're getting caught like up in I web. said, it's... they are getting caught in this freaking web. <laughs> Anyways, uh, I'm always happy to see Trish Stratus. I really am. Yeah. And I think a lot of it is nostalgia era. And yes, you did help me get through my, uh, my, my, you know. Yeah. Younger years sure. as a teenager. But anyways, it's always exciting to see. I really appreciate that when she came out, you know, and, you know, what's going on. I, I just felt like it was cool. Like, yeah. like I wasn't, oh, great, another person came here just to get a match. I'm cool with it. Matt, anybody you're interested in, in, in seeing this summer Well, I'm glad that he's uh, looking forward to the woman who changes diapers for a living now. <laughs> That's always fun. That makes her even more hotter. <laughs> Okay. Love you, love you Trish. <laughs> love you, Trish. I, I don't know what that says about your di- diaper habits, but <laughs> some, something odd is going on, but that's okay. <laughs> hey, everyone has their own fetishes. That's <laughs> right. Um, you know, in the end, uh, I think the match that is going to kind of uh, surprise people is uh, I want to say that Ember Moon takes the belt off of Bailey. Goes heel. Mm. That'd be cool. And goes heel. Okay, I'd like to see that. Yeah, I can see that. And I'm 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 looking uh, forward to the Finn Balor and the Bray Wyatt. Bray is gonna be awesome, right? He's got a. I mean, he's gonna deliver. He always do. You mean the fiend? <clears throat> the fiend. Whatever the. So, fuck. so it's gonna be really great. So anyway, that's gonna be SummerSlam. Of course, gonna be this week. Oh, wait, you want to say something else? Are we only talking about SummerSlam? I was about to get off of SummerSlam, but you want to, you have something else you want to say? Oh, no, no. Well, when you say we're talking about SummerSlam, are we talking about everything in that whole weekend or just SummerSlam? Well, you, you, oh, my God. Just say NXT. <laughs> Can we talk about say. NXT? Well, go ahead. Go oh, ahead. I'm sorry. That's I, I, fine. I, yeah. I didn't know if that was included. That's, That's fine. Why go I was ahead. Saying SummerSlam. I'm sorry. I will be honest. This is my first time going to a live NXT pay-per-view our takeover in general. So that's going to be very memorable with me. I'll be sharing that with DJ Impact, hopefully if he doesn't mess up the names uh, of the people. Oh boy. But um, no, no. But what I'm really excited for is, um, I, you know what? I'll be honest with you. I really, really am starting to dig Mia Yim. I really am getting into her uh, as far as like watching her more often and kind of like I'm really feeling it. So I'm really super excited to, for, for her to go up against uh, Shayna Baszler. I hope that she does it. Welcome to the party on that one. Yeah, see? So, you know, uh, yeah. and of course, you know, I want to see Adam Cole, baby. So, you know, I'm excited about that. So that's all I have to say. For NXT? NXT. All right. Did you want to say anything, Steve? NXT or are well, you good? I mean, I obviously Cole and Gargano are gonna tear the house down. That's to be expected, right? Um, I actually, I think that uh, Candice LeRae and Io Shirai yeah. could could be a show stealer. <clears throat> um, both of those ladies are amazing in their own right, and right. I think that they'll put on one hell of a match. Okay, Matt, not, you have anyone NXT? I'm uh, looking forward to. Um, Shigi Shijama and uh, mm-hmm. the uh, <laughs> the artist formerly known as the Velveteen Dream. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, there we have it. Yep. Let's go to now some uh, news that uh, came out not too long ago. I think this weekend. Harley Race passed away. And uh, Matt, can you just give us a little uh, info on that? 
Well, um, first, you know, one of the things I do want to say, um, uh, talking to uh, Simon Gotch uh, a few weeks back, mm-hmm. um, he did train with uh, Harley, and he had some fascinating uh, stories about Harley Race. He was a one of a kind, uh, real bad motherfucker. Mm-hmm. Like he was a tough son of a bitch. Yeah. Um, he was respected by all. Um, you know, you hate to see people pass away, but at the same time, he was in very bad health. Yeah. Uh, let's see. I met him in 2011. Mm. Mm. And so, you know, even back then, eight years ago, um, he was in a little bit of a, a start of a decline of health. Okay. He wasn't moving around. Sure. You know, the same, uh, you know, uh, you know, it, it's just hard to see people that you respect. Yeah. You know, like that. But um, one thing Trevor Murdoch uh, did put out there on uh, the Twitterverse is uh, he said, I just want to put, a, put this out there. Harley needed to be transferred from Atlanta to St. Louis. He needed to make a med flight. Because he was in rough shape. Mm-hmm. Medicare wouldn't help him. Mm-hmm. The call was made at WWE, and 10 minutes later, it was paid in full. Vince McMahon never blinked an eye. He wanted to make sure Harley was taken care of. Wow. Thank you, Vince. You gave me two more days with Harley. Wow. Uh, hashtag thank you, WWE. Hashtag everyone should know. So that is the kind of stuff um, yeah. that, you know, when you talk about someone... I'd say Harley Race, Ric Flair, um, you know, they were of the last of that generation that Mm -hmm. came out of that, you know, that hybrid of um, the old school wrestling mentality into the new era of wrestling that made it sports entertainment yeah and um you're seeing i mean uh, nick bockwinkle's gone you know uh bruno san martino you're starting to see all these guys they're, they're gone yeah and um now you know you are at the the point where you have a guy like flair um you know zabisco uh you know he's kind of in that same boat uh you know these are the the final guys who are kind of left from that era um and then you you have your hogan's and um you know the guys kind of from that next phase of the uh the 80s you know wrestling so it's a reminder to those of us who are old enough to be kids, whether it have been, you know, kids in the 70s, uh, kids in the 60s even, kids in the 80s, um, that that youth that you had is uh, is dying. Yeah. You know? And uh, it's great to see, you know, even Vince. Well, let's face it, Vince getting up there. That's and true. So, you know, it's great to see that the WWE appreciates that. And I think, too, that's the the nice thing when you look at Hunter and Stephanie and Shane and where the WWE will be headed in terms of taking care of the older superstars mm-hmm. like this. They'll carry on that tradition. Right. Because they respect that. Yes. So. Um but uh you know you, you can't go wrong with you know for for as much as Harley Race you know, tore down the house uh, as his reign of NWA champion and had those matches with, you know, Flair and Dusty and, you know, you can go mm-hmm. on. Um, you know, for a generation, he was an old guy in a cape and a crown. <laughs> yeah. Accompanied to the ring by the fabulous Mula. Right. Who was already 90 years old at that point, it seemed like. <laughs> so... <laughs> You know, that was your WrestleMania three moment and you know, now you look at it and Bobby and Harley and Mula and J Y D they're all gone. Yeah. So you know, in some ways it's 
you, you look at wrestling and you say, boy, all these people die young. But then you look at it and you go, boy, all these people are dying old. <laughs> yeah. So it was great to have these people around and yeah. for them to pass on the knowledge. Um, and, uh, you know, it's it's a shame. But uh, the great thing is you have the WWE Network. Mm-hmm. Uh, you have YouTube. And, you know, there's tons of things that you could find on Harley Race. And if you don't know much about them and you're a young wrestler, you need to learn. Yeah. Harley Race will uh, always uh, be remembered. So we're going to uh, transition right into our our live show <laughs> <laughs> that we had at Boulder Station where we had Rob Van Dam. We just want to thank all of the listeners for coming out and hanging out with us. There was a nice crowd and uh, the drinks were fly. Would you say, Simon, you're looking at me with that? That well, look. I remember the live show, but I remember Katie Forbes was there too. She was there, and and she was quite amazing. Yes, and, and I just want to say that. <laughs> okay, so we want to again just uh just thank everyone for coming out and just keep listening because we're gonna have another show again. It will be the the last Monday, Monday August twenty sixth, August twenty sixth, back at Boulder Station. So keep listening as you will know who that guest will be. And remember, it's a, it's a free event, so we just ask. And it's not going to be Harley Race. It's not going to be Harley Race, no. Not at all. <laughs> I'm but sure you was looking to book Harley Race, too. <laughs> I had a, I had a call in. I had an urge back. Yeah. Oh, boy. Matt, you're going somewhere. But we, but we, <laughs> but we love all of our, uh, our fans. We really do from the bottom of our hearts, seriously. Because... Um, you are like the Vegas bad boys of podcasting's lifeblood. You yeah, know, pretty so we appreciate you. All right, final words. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, no, thank you guys seriously for for everybody that decided to come out, for everybody that helped us to get the word out. Maybe you weren't in Vegas. Um, the the live show was definitely a success. Uh, special thank you to Rob Van Dam and Katie Forbes. Um, for spending time out of their busy schedule with us, and uh, it, it was a, it was an amazing time, mm-hmm. and yeah, one that will not be forgotten. So thank you to anybody who was a part of that. Simon Street, final words. Um, although I did not ask Rob that night, I really want to know where can I learn how to do the twerk of death. I want to know. <laughs> and for those that are probably wondering, like, what the hell is he talking about? You just got to listen to our live show mm-hmm. because uh, it was very interesting. Oh, shit. Out of the oh, shit. They're doing the oh, shit uh, <laughs> segment out of nowhere, which I appreciate them. So that's my last word. Okay. Twerk of death. Hashtag twerk, twerk of death. Twerk of death. I'm just saying. Okay. Knock All right. you down the stairs, it will. <laughs> Matt Michaels, final words. Meat flaps. <laughs> <laughs> Was y'all expecting anything different to come out of this this man's mouth? I'm snorting on freaking. <laughs> Let's try this again. Um, Matt Michaels, final words. Vagina lips. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Just keep it in. Just keep it in. Hey-o. And not the meat curtains. <laughs> Apparently, it's time to go ahead and just end that show. <laughs> Meat flaps. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, oh, damn. It's thank so good everyone for listening. <laughs> and uh, we will see you next week. All right. <laughs> Pussy lips? Oh, God. <laughs> We're out of here. Trim them. <laughs> it's time to trim them. <laughs> thank you so much for checking out that video. If you liked what we did there, make sure you hit that like button. If you're new here, slap that subscribe button and ring the bell. That way you can be a part of the notification squad. Follow us on social media, at Vegas Bad Boys with a Z, on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. And until next time, we will see you in the next video.